Okay. Ask to go into open. Ask broadcasting to bring us into open. Broadcasting, you bring us into open session, please. Slide down. Okay, members. Uh, okay, members. Uh, um, okay, we have no apologies. Uh, Chairperson's business. business. Um, I want to advise members that I have requested an urgent uh, written briefing from the Department on the river pollution incident that occurred over the weekend in the Uglish River uh, down in County Tyrone. And I want to refer members to the memo from the clerk at page 33 on privilege and procedural fairness, which was discussed at last week's uh, meeting. However, due to a number of sound issues, um, some members were able to hear what was being discussed. Um, members, any questions they want to um, on the contents of that memo or memo? Are you okay to note it? Chair. Yeah. Yes, uh, thanks. Listen, uh, um, it's great to hear that you have written to the committee or, or sorry, the department on that issue. Can I suggest that we also do the same for the um, oil spill that happened in Donegadee Beach? Um, I know that the Environment Agency um, were involved in a, a clean-up, but information has been very scant, and I've been getting questions about it. Would that be possible? It happened about three weeks ago. Yeah, uh, I'm sure everybody will agree with that. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Here now. Members, just put your mics on mute. Um, uh, stop a bit that background noise. Um, so the draft minutes um, of the 29th of April, it's page 36. And um, uh, can I seek agreement for the minutes? Okay. And um, I'll sign the minutes uh, very shortly. Okay, members, we're going to move on now uh, very quickly to the um, item six. It's oral evidence from the PSNA, uh, withdrawal of DERA and local authority staff from ports. I want to refer members to a briefing paper from the PSNA at page 47, the terms of reference to the committee ports investigation at page 49, and the hands out from the previous PSNA evidence session on 15th of April, that's at page 53, and the evidence session with Mid and East Antrim Borough Council on the 22nd of April, that's at page 61. I want to welcome by Starleaf uh, temporary ACC. Uh, Bobby Singleton and ACC uh, Mark McEwen. Yeah. Mark is uh, is Bobby uh, there? Just ask Mark into the Mark, can Mark be brought on the spotlight, please? Not there yet. Mark, is it there today? Oh, it's me, Bobby. Yeah, do you have Mark's there? He's in the spot there. Mark, can you uh, hear us, sir? Um, Ask him again, yes, sir. Hello, Mark. Can you uh, hear us? Mark? Bobby? Must be having broadcasting issues there then. Do you want to just take five minutes to allow them to see can we get her yeah. in? And in the meantime, if you wanted to go on to um, the written briefing on um, Item 7. Six. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Item 7. Yeah, item 7 on page 6. Yeah. And just wait till we get them in. Okay, members. Well, just as um, the PSNI are getting online here, uh, we'll just go move on to the next item, and then we can come back as soon as the um, the issue is resolved. Uh, it's item seven. It's a written briefing, DERA, consideration of the work plan for the horse racing amendment bill and committee motion to extend the committee stage. I want to refer members to the memo from the clerk at page 85, which contains the committee motion at page 91. I want to advise members that the bill has had its second reading on the 22nd, 26th of April and has been referred to the area committee for the committee stage of the legislative process. Stella, can you brief the committee on the work plan for the committee stage of the bill? Yes. Um, yes, members, as I said, the, the, the committee stage um, of, the, of the, the bill will involve detailed consideration of the bill. And the committee will be expected to take evidence from interested parties, including the government departments, individuals and organisations with an interest in it, and then to scrutinise each clause and schedule of the bill and discuss possible amendments or proposals for it. 
Um, just to remind you that committees have no power to amend a bill, but they re prepare a report for our assembly, and that report would include any proposals for amendments that the committee made table so that they can be voted on in the assembly. Um, there is normally, understanding orders, a committee has 30 working days, which in practice is about six um, weeks from the date of referral to consider and take evidence on the bill and do its report. I have to say that uh, in general, uh, as, a, as a broad practice, no committee ever manages to do it in, in 30 days. Um, they can, um, they normally uh, uh, extend that before the conclusion of the working days that the, 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 um, the chair or the minister would take a motion to the assembly to, to extend the, the committee stage. Um, so it's highly likely that this committee will need a second extension uh, to the committee stage of this bill simply because of the workload that it has in front of it. So the way the bill sits at the minute, the committee would have to report by the 9th of June. And that's when you think of the work that the committee has in front of it, um, that's probably not going to happen. Um, so the timetable that you put together a, has to take into account other bills in the committee and um, obviously legislation is a priority, but we know that the private members bill on climate change is going to second stage next Monday and will be with the committee um, on the 11th, um, of, which is next Tuesday. Um, so the committee will have to decide which bill it wishes to prioritise, either the horse racing bill or the climate change bill. Once the committee's made that decision, um, you will place a public notice into the regional newspapers and social media advertising the committee stage of the bill. Um, and just to emphasise, because it's come up before, committees do not do a consultation, as people would understand it, under Section 75 of the Northern Ireland Act. But what we do is a call for evidence. We're specifically asking for evidence on each clause of the bill. We're not necessarily looking at policy, you're looking at clauses of the bill. Um, I'm going to suggest that because of the climate change bill, you're unlikely to be able to start taking evidence on this bill until mid to late autumn, and that you, you defer putting out your public notice until near that time. There's no point putting out a public notice calling for um, evidence and then letting that evidence sit there because you raise an expectation that the committee is going to do something with it straight away. Um, Things the committee do will scrutinise the delegated powers, and I have um, mentioned what those are. They're in page eight, or in paragraph eight of the memo. Other scrutiny points will be paragraph nine. So you'll consider the financial aspects of it, and as I've mentioned there, at paragraph ten, you might want to consider the compliance regime. So you know, including what do they define as an offence? How is that offence policed? what investigative powers are provided and what the associated penalties are. And you'd look at the appropriateness of all of that. There's a list of stakeholders at Appendix A that members might want to consider and they might want to add to that list of stakeholders. You'd also need to decide who you're going to take oral evidence from. And again, there's information there at Appendix A um, and you, you might want to consider that. Um, I'm saying this now because I think if you do defer the work on this until autumn, you don't have to make your final decisions on this now. You can wait and do that in the autumn. Um, Rays will provide a research paper for you, uh, for all MLAs on the bill, their bill paper, but um, this committee will see it first and will hear from, from Rays as well. The Rays papers are normally done on a thematic basis. Um, we will get written evidence in as well, um, writing out to those people that we specifically, and organisations that we specifically want written evidence from, and the public notice encourages members of the public to come. So there's a work plan laid out below for you to look at, just under paragraph 18. Um, and I haven't put in exact dates, I've just showed that I think you're going to need um, probably about um, a six meetings to take all the evidence from. This is, I'm assuming that you'll run this alongside your other work, so you'll not be able to devote two or three meetings exclusively to it, and that you will then need um, a further six to seven meetings to consider that evidence, do your clause by clause, and write your report. 
And again, members, do not ever underestimate, even in a single issue bill such as this one, do not ever underestimate the, 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 the level of work and the time that this thing takes, these kind of um, issues take within the committee. So given that, that um, you only have 30 days, um, which means that the, the, your committee stage ends, I think I said 1st of June there, sorry, um, I said 9th earlier on, and you might want to take note of the indicative timetable for the climate change bill, which is in the pack this week, but which has not been yet agreed. It'll have to be deferred to next week because of lack of time. Um, I'm proposing that you start taking your evidence on this in the autumn, but that you give yourself a long lead-in time and that you extend your consideration of the bill to January 2022. Now, that does not mean that you will report in January 22. You can actually report sooner if you so desire, but it allows you leeway in case other things happen. And as you know, members, you will see that um, this, in this committee, other things happening is a regular occurrence. So um, that's why I'm, I'm suggesting that long lead-in time, um, which um, you, will, you, you will see there. Um, so there's a draft motion in the pack, again for you, at um, page 91 to look at that you'll be asked to consider. Um, again, if necessary, you can defer this to next week if you want, but it would be preferable if you can agree it today. Um, and then um, just, um, Declan, do you want to maybe advise about interactions with the, the Dalo, or do you want me to do that? No, you can. Uh, you want me to do that? Yeah, okay. we'll go ahead. So, um, members, just one further thing to ask you to note is that um, I have informally, informally off the record, um, had uh, brief conversations with the um, department liaison officer regarding the extension to the timetable. And again, informally, off the record, officials have indicated that their preference would be that the proposed extension to the committee stage would be October, not January, because they would like the committee report to be out of the committee by October so that the bill could have royal assent by December. And that would allow the reinstatement of the payments of the horse racing fund to resume. But if you agreed to that shorter extension, they would be putting the committee under considerable pressure on other aspects of its forward work programme. Uh, without a doubt, it would mean probably having to have additional meetings to manage that workload. Um, that is up to yourself um, if, you, if you want to do that. But the proposals are that you extend to the end of January taking into account that DERA would prefer that the committee have a shorter extension and that you defer further consideration and agreeing of the work plan um, until, um, you, until later, probably um, September 2021, um, and that you agree that the drafting of the public notice is deferred until the committee starts to, to seek its, its um, evidence. Okay, members. Any, any comments you want to make in relation to the proposal as outlined? Okay. Um, okay, members. Uh, can, can they talk? Are they... Members, can you hear there? There's nothing coming in on the WhatsApp. So, sorry, Chair. I haven't put in the WhatsApp, but you just said I was no I'd be content with that. It's okay. Thank you. Okay, hi. Right. Thank you. There's nothing else. Okay, so. Can I seek agreement for the following based on the fact that we can and will revisit this work plan when time allows for further consideration? An extension to the committee stage of the bill to the end of January 2022, which will be done by way of a committee motion to be signed uh, at the meeting of the members agree, which will, if you are happy enough. And members may wish to note that the committee can, of course, report before that date if we wish. Um, agreement for the drafting of a public notice for a call for evidence, which committee uh, which will sign agree prior to publication. The list of stakeholders to seek written and oral evidence from using the thematic approach as identified by Reyes and the timetable outlining the work plan at page 88. So, are members, uh, members okay with that? 
Okay. Uh, okay. Just to give you a quick update, um, there, there are definitely technical problems with the PSNI. Mm -hmm. uh, they can see in here but can't contact connect their cameras or mics. Yeah. So they are uh, continuing to try and to get online yeah. for us. So we will just move on. And we move on to item eight then. Okay, hey, sorry, Chair, can you hear us now? Oh, yes. <laughs> we got you. Oh, here. Yeah. Uh, who, who have we got we here? See so, uh, so, Chair, it's uh, Mark McEwen here and Bobby Singleton. Oh, if you can see me at the moment, can you, Chair? Yeah, I'd like, yeah, yes, Mark and Bobby, we got you there. We were overcome the technical difficulties now, so, so it's good to see you. So, so, listen, could I invite us now to uh, uh, um, brief the committee members and then the members will ask some questions? Certainly, Chair, thank you. Um, I think, as you said at the outset of the session, we last gave evidence back on the 15th of April. And following our session, further evidence was given by the Chief Executive and the Mayor, and Mid and Mayor and of Mid and East Antrim Council on the 22nd of April. So we welcome the opportunity to come back to provide clarification to the committee on a number of matters which have arisen. Um, and we're happy to address any further questions that they may have. But Chair, at the outset, can I just begin with an apology to the committee? Because in my evidence on the 15th of April, I was asked by the member for South Belfast, did the minister or Mid and East Andrew Borough Council report any threats that they had received or were, they, or were aware of to the PSNI? Now, Chair, my evidence, I replied no, not to the people at border posts. And I have to clarify that this was not in fact the case. It has subsequently been established that the district commander for Mid and East Andrew, Superintendent Michael Simpson, did in fact have contact with the chief executive about a reputed threat to staff on Saturday, the 30th of January. At that time, the chief executive told Superintendent Simpson that she had been made aware that staff were under threat and that vehicle registrations were being recorded at the port. I understand that Superintendent Simpson then liaised with our own intelligence branch and was able to establish the police had that same day received the same information anonymously. Um, the police, however, assessed that this information was uncorroborated and unsubstantiated, as I covered in my evidence back on the 15th. Um, and that assessment has not changed since. Um, so I just I think it's very important, Chair, that I put the record straight on that particular point. And I'm grateful to have ACC McEwen with me today, who unfortunately wasn't available on the 15th. And it was owing to ACC McEwen's absence that I was asked to give a brief on behalf of the organisation. And again, I apologise to the members of the committee that that wasn't more accurate. Um, but we are here today together. Um, and I'm confident we can provide the committee with all the information that they need. Um, and I know that Mark now wants to speak to some specific points. So uh, thank you, Chair. Um, and, and again, I suppose, just to reiterate, an apology from myself. I wasn't able to attend at the last um, uh, committee uh, session due to a, a clash of diaries that was required at the policing board. So. Um, I'm grateful for the opportunity to come today to, to clarify and maybe set a little bit of context around some of the issues that have been raised by members and, and hopefully hopefully give some clarity. If, if I may, Chair, I, I'd, I'd like to cover a number of points looking at um, the command and control structures, the meetings and the contact that took place uh, with, with partners in particular, um, the threat assessment and, and risk assessments and our operational activity around the period. And I think by doing that, I will hopefully be able to, to bring some clarity as to the, the sequence of events. It was made mention of by some committee members um, reflecting back to Operation Yellowhammer, um, which was for the, the original um, date back in January uh, 2020. And, and uh, I suppose a comparison drawn between the, the structures that were in place for that and the structures that we saw in place um, around uh, D20, as it's known, the 31st of December 2020, which was the end of tr transition date. Um, I think it's really important that we, we understand that under the civil contingencies for Northern Ireland uh, protocols, there was no SCG up and running. There was no C3 structures in terms of a hub that gathers in the information, um, specifically in relation to the end of transition, in the way that there was around Operation Yellowhammer. Operation Yellowhammer was uh, predicated largely on a no-deal scenario. So those, uh, those structures and those systems were all in place. 
they they were then last year, as everyone will be aware, they were in place um, with regards to Operation Tala um, from a policing perspective or the response to coronavirus. And it was um, discussed by ourselves with the Department of Justice and indeed discussed on the 9th of December at the C3 meeting with all the various partners in place as to whether or not it was felt that those same structures were needed um, to turn their attention to the end of transition. And it was decided at that meeting that they weren't. And I say that because um, it has been, uh, as I say, comparisons have been drawn with Operation Yellowhammer. And I think it's important that the committee understand there were different civil contingencies uh, structures in place for that than there were for the end of transition. And those are the, the, the structures that would provide for a central hub that allows everyone to have operational awareness and, 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 and understanding. Uh, I mentioned SCG, a strategic coordinating group. So with, despite the fact that the, the overall civil contingencies uh, arrangements had not been triggered, it is available to any partner or any member of that group to, to request and require a, st uh, a strategic coordinating group. At this point, from a policing perspective, we didn't feel that was, that was necessary, but I'll come back to that um, when I talk about the partnership arrangements that we, that we put in place. In terms of our contact, particularly around portal arrangements and the SPS checks, um, as, as the committee is well aware, that uh, the SPS reference group chaired by uh, DERA Permanent Secretary was in fact the, the, the primary place for those arrangements to be discussed, um, for awareness to be shared with other partners and for us to understand what the impact of those checks would be. Uh, Solus representatives and ourselves were, were, were all part of that. And so stemming from sort of the 9th of June 2020, right through until the 7th of December 2020, police attended those meetings to provide our operational overview. Uh, so there were six meetings in total. And in fact, on the 28th of October 2020, we presented to that group the shift of the police operation from what had previously been Operation Cookhouse and Nebraskan to Operation Skies, so that all our partners would understand where our primary focus was, the concerns we had around potential protest um, and disruption to the infrastructure. So we also outlined at that chair our contingencies and the mitigations that we would put in place with that. And core to that were the communications with partners. So moving on from that, then we, in addition to that, we then pulled together a partners group. Um, th there, there has also been comment around gold meetings taking place. And the fact that there was some surprise on the part of, of, uh, of some of the partners that, that gold meetings were up and running. In fact, the gold planning and gold meetings had been ongoing from 2019, but I think there again, there's a perhaps a lack of understanding about what that means. The gold command structure, as per approved professional practice, is an internal policing structure. So we didn't invite any of our partners to that. That is about us ensuring the strategic direction, ensuring that our silver commanders have what they need, that everybody understands the plan. And, uh, and that's about the governance of the policing operation. It's not about partners. What is important here is the fact that we then um, created a partners group, which was primarily um, law enforcement partners, um, Belfast Harbour Police, uh, UK Border Force, Immigration. But we included DERA in that as well as the lead agency, as I say, around the SPS checks. Uh, DERA were invited to those and attended. Um, and in fact, we have very solid um, working relationships with our partners in that. And they ran from the 27th of October um, uh, and are still, still running today. So that, that kind of brings us through then the period where we, we went through the transition date. We had a gold command up and running. Um, as, as most people will be aware, the immediate aftermath of transition on the 31st of December was, was relatively calm, we then started to see the, the rise in tensions um, and indeed the, 
the, the concerns and then the graffiti started to appear and other local issues arising. So graffiti both around uh, the, the protocol, around uh, members of the DUP and, and others. At that point, uh, as has been noted prior to this on the 21st of January, uh, I held another partners meeting and discussed that. We were processing the intelligence that we had. Our intelligence was clear at this point that we felt, um, well, the intelligence assessment is that loyalist uh, paramilitaries uh, were not behind the graffiti. They were not intent on taking part or driving any of the action around portal uh, activities. And that, uh, that remains the case today. But I do want to, and I've stated this both publicly, um, on the uh, in, in various media um, interviews on the second of February, um, and to partners consistently throughout January and into February, there is a real difference here, though, between what our threat assessment is and what our risk assessment is, and I think again there's been some conflation of the two things, which has led to confusion. The Whilst we have said consistently, and still say that today, that that is the threat assessment, that does not take into account the rising tensions, which I, I briefed the Northern Ireland Affairs Select Committee on, I briefed partners on, and I briefed the media on, that there were rising tensions. We can't rule out the activities of individuals. We saw that manifest itself in terms of graffiti. We understand from an employer's perspective um, that that causes real concerns for employees, um, for unions, and it's for the employer to work that through, um, through a formal risk assessment supported by ourselves. And then we start to look at what mitigations and security we can put in place to reassure employees. So to recap, just whilst the threat assessment still um, it has the same, the intelligence assessment um, provided by ourselves with partners says that it is not, in our view, um, loyalist paramilitaries who are driving this activity. We can see on the streets the rising tension, we can see the rising graffiti, and we can see that that will, of course, cause concern for employees. We then, um, and, and as had been discussed uh, at a number of occasions through our partners' meetings in the planning for this operation, um, provided crime prevention officers, and in fact, we provided people from our own security branch who have a level of expertise in this area, who don't normally work with partners, but on this occasion, we, we provided that, to look at the layers of security that employers could put in place around their employees. Those things, for example, range from whether or not an employee has to do physical checks, or whether they can do those checks remotely, can they be office-based in the court, or do they have to be out on, on the ground? Are there CCTV and signage in the area? Is it in a secure part of the court or out with the secure area of the court? Um, and, and, and so all those layers of security um, are things that the employer has to consider with our support. And then we come to the reassurance patrols. And we have very strong communications through local district throughout this period with local councils and with other partners to say that they would be providing high visibility reassurance patrols uh, to, try and, to try and do a number of things, primarily to try and prevent any of the activity we saw, graffiti, um, where that may, um, or, or other, which is in effect criminal damage or other illegal behaviour, um, to, to, to be alert to any protest and to provide reassurance to to the to intervene where we see any of that criminal behaviour and to provide reassurance to employees. We were very careful with our messaging through our partners, um, and, and I think that has been reflected, to say that the presence of police there, both by ourselves and in Belfast, Belfast Harbour Police, were there to provide reassurance um, as opposed to responding to any specific threat. So I, I think there's a number of, of, of elements to this that perhaps um, haven't been fully understood, and again, I take responsibility for that. Um, I wasn't able to be here, um, but, uh, but hopefully, as, as we work through the various elements, people will, will understand the, the sequence of events. Okay.
thank you, Mark. Uh, number of members who want to ask questions, and I suppose there's, there's just a couple of um, there's a couple of uh, issues just want to reference to uh, before we move we move around. Uh, in the um, evidence session on the 22nd of April here, the um, the the councillor Johnson uh, made. Uh, complaints and was backed up by the CEO about the the delay uh, and information uh, coming from the PSNA, and that they had uh, asked for written assessment on five occasions and finally had to go to the chief constable. What would be your response to uh, that, um, Mark? Well, uh, first and foremost, the assessment provided verbally on the 27th and the first and publicly in the media um, was the assessment as we saw it. We worked together with the security service to provide the written assessment. We do all our due diligence to ensure that we have all, all uh, the information, intelligence and facts available to us to provide that assessment. So that is not uh, purely within the, the control of PSNI. We have to work with partners around that. So we held the meeting um, the extraordinary partners meeting, which I invited the local authorities to, along with uh, HMRC, also in attendance at that were the Northern Ireland Office and Department of Justice. Um, that's an unusual partners meeting, and I was very clear at the outset of that meeting that this was not to be seen as uh, an SCG that I mentioned earlier, a strategic coordinating group. It was not to take the place of that, and I hadn't asked for that, um, but it had sort of the feel of that chair. Um, and that shows the seriousness with which we took partners' concerns in this, but in the void of those other civil contingencies um, structures being in place, um, I took it as the goal commander for the police to arrange that meeting. I was very clear about our threat assessment at that point. I gave a, sure, a commitment to, to, to try and provide the written document as soon as I possibly could. As I say, uh, you know, whether, whether people write to the Chief Constable or, or, or not doesn't really speed up the process. I was the goal commander and responsible for that. The, the written assessment was provided two days later on the 4th of February, um, and that was as, as, as quick as we could have turned it around with our partners. So if that caused undue angst, um, then that's unfortunate. We did have good communication with partners uh, in the meantime to say, you know, we are working on it, it will come. And I also understood actually that partners wanted that formal written assessment before they could um, meet with their unions, discuss it with employees and start their formal risk assessment process. So whilst it's, it's uh, uh, unfortunate that it, it took those two days, um, that, that's the process we had to go through. And indeed that has been you know, revisited on a weekly basis, as I say, with our partners' meetings. And we have uh, provided um, written uh, updates to say there's been no change. I also gave a commitment that if there was a change in that uh, threat assessment, then we would call an extraordinary partners meeting and come together uh, as quickly as possible so that people would have that reassurance. And just just finally, it was also mentioned in the evidence uh, from mid Antrim uh, Council here um, about, their, um, about them not being included in the gold command structure. Um, why would you know? You know, I'm listening to what you're saying that this is an internal uh, policing structure. Why would why would MEA think that they should have been involved in that? There, surely they, they they should know that there that this is an internal policing structure. Why do you why do you why do you think that that's, that this was cited as they said they were shocked that they weren't included or weren't part of this uh, gold uh, struck command structure? I'm afraid I can't answer that, Chair. Um, I've discussed the civil contingencies arrangements, so I, I don't really understand that. Um, and maybe there is a confusion with the partners' meetings, um, but uh, but I don't under, I, I don't know. So I think it was never it was never a case that the likes of MEA or any other council was involved in a, a gold command structure before. No, they, they, they certainly weren't involved in in the gold command structure for Operation Skies, which have been running throughout that year. Um, so no. Yeah, that's that's hundred percent. Thank you, um, uh, John. Chair, so thank you. And I can make a brief comment, but before I ask a couple of quick questions, um, the, the on occasions such as this, I always make clear that that I'm a, a member of the 
Northern Ireland Policing Board, and I think it's wise to do that in this context. Um, separate to that, can I, can I thank the uh, Assistant Chief Constables McEwen and, and Singleton for being here. We know the, the pressures that the organisation is under, not least of all in light of recent attacks on, on their colleagues in Dungiven and indeed in Lard, and they have my support in, in, in working on that and, and many other things. Um, Two, two quick questions th through you, Chair. The, fir the first one is that it, it's now clear that there were a, a number of updates and briefings given to um, Mid and East Antrim Council between late January and early February. Yet, on uh, and we now know this to, to be fact, on the 30th of January, the Chief Executive of Mid and East Antrim Council wrote to the Cabinet Office and told the Cabinet Office, I quote, I am aware of the involvement of paramilitary groups and recent protests. At Lauren Port, um, can we have it clarified that that statement could not have been made on the basis of any briefing given by police, and also that as of the thirtieth of January there had not been any protests at Lauren Port? So, uh, in terms of protests, I am trying to. So we, I know we did have a protest. Um, a small number of people prior to transition date. Um, and I'm thinking it was the last week in November. Okay. Um, so, we, so we did see a small protest there. It, it didn't cause us any concerns. And as I say, in part of the planning um, for this, we did anticipate there may be protests. Um, our, our, our primary concern was that with that was around balancing the right to protest the ongoing coronavirus regulations, and indeed, more importantly, for, from an EU exit uh, perspective, um, disruption to the critical infrastructure. So I think, um, yes, at the, at the end of, of November, we did have um, some protest, and I think we have had some since, uh, possibly at the end of April. Um, however, in, to, 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 to clarify, in terms of the involvement of paramilitaries, as, as I said earlier, I consistently given the threat assessment that we do not assess that loyalist paramilitaries are behind this. We've said it publicly, we've said it to Northern Ireland Affairs Committee and to the House of Lords Committee. Um, and, and should that change, we would, of course, inform partners um, uh, uh, as, as soon as possible. Okay, so thank you. The second question, um, at the uh, evidence given by the Council on the 22nd of April, Comments were made by, by the Mayor of, of Mid East Antrim about being badly let down by police and talked of chasing the police with a begging bowl, I think were the words used. Um, can, I, can I have it clarified, um, given that, that this was a, a council keen to be involved in Gold Command, keen to contact, the, according to their own records, the Chief Constable, did they at any point um, seek a meeting with yourselves to specifically address the concerns that were later expressed? So, from my recollection, um, they they didn't seek a meeting directly, um, but I would have to I would just have to check on that um, in terms of emails. I know there was quite a, a, a there was a, a number of emails I received um, with pictures of graffiti in, in various parts of the country, um, which was um, helpfully uh, from the council uh, trying to ensure that we were all cited on on various things that were going on. Um, from, uh, as I say, from the 2nd of February, they have been involved in those partners meetings. Okay. Um, there, was, there was no ask, as I say, I, 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 I don't think there was an ask for, for a direct meeting. Um, but if there was, we would have managed that through the partners group. Um, and in fact, prior to this, we had managed that with Dara as the primary lead for the arrangements at the ports. Also, there is, there's, it's important to note that um, because we're dealing with Newry and Morn, uh, District Council, Belfast City Council, uh, Derry City and Straban, and yeah. Midland Stantrum, we had as part of our overall operational plan, that engagement was being carried out by those various district commanders or local leads. And that's important because we need to understand the local nuances. It's disappointing um, for me to hear how the, the Mayor feels, because I believe we put uh, significant effort and resource into providing reassurance around Lord Port um, and very proactive on the ground 
um, liaison, both of port, port authorities and other partners. Um, nonetheless, I, I think, I think again, I go back to the fact there are two things going on here. One is our threat assessment and an assessment of the intelligence. And then there's the feeling that actually there were very high levels of tension within the community. That's possibly being felt locally. There is, um, uh, and certainly it, it had an unsettling effect on, on, on some employees. So, so it perhaps things coming from, from two different two different angles and an expectation um, that the police would be doing something different. But um, as hopefully I've explained to the committee today, the the command structures, the protocols, and our role in this, um, I, I think we've delivered a good service. Okay, so thank you for the, both those answers. Thank you. Uh, Patsy? Yeah, th thanks both, uh, gentlemen, for joining us here today and coming back and uh, being open and, and forthright with us today. Just I wanted to reverse a wee bit back there. Um, you're probably aware now um, that uh, a letter was written by the Chief Executive of um, Mid East Anthem Borough Council to the Cabinet Office, as dated the 30th of, of January. Now, um, on that particular issue, what I wanted to find out was it, it did refer that letter to um, the Chief Executive, but this, this is her words, I am aware of the involvement of paramilitary groups. Uh, now, two things from that. Um, first, and I'm sure you have clarified it, but just for the record of this inquiry, um, were you aware of the involvement of paramilitary groups? That's, that's the first thing. And can you clarify if that was or wasn't the case? The second thing is, um, was there any follow-up with yourselves to clarify or to understand the substance or the basis for that claim, um, either via the Cabinet Office or maybe the NIO or any of their, how shall we call them, ancillary agencies to establish if there was basis for that claim at all? Yes, Chair. So first and foremost, uh, as, I, as I've said repeatedly, there was no... Um, there was no intelligence. Our threat assessment was that there is no involvement of loyalist paramilitaries in directing or or, or, or involvement in protesting graffiti in any of this. And, and we've been very clear on that. That remains the, the situation to, to this date. Um, I wasn't cited on the letter uh, to the Cabinet Office. The, we, we have ongoing um, uh, throughout this period, communication with Mid and East Antrim Council, there was nothing arising out of those conversations that led us to alter or change that threat assessment. Was there any indication to yourselves from Mid and East Antrim Council at any point of um, that particular element, as th that uh, judgment or that claim that was in the letter to the Cabinet Office that Ms Donaghy was aware of the involvement of paramilitary groups? Was that report or that claim made at any stage to PSNI for investigation? We, we did. We did seek clarity on that point. There was a concern held by, I think, most of our partners. It would be fair to say that that perhaps there was some involvement. There was going to be some involvement. Um, we saw clarity in that, and as I say, nothing out of those conversations led us to to alter our view. Um, there was a specific phone call on the thirtieth of, of, of January, I believe. Um, on the 29th of January. Um, so, so I'm aware of the concerns, but when when we then feed in those concerns and carry out our threat assessment, that threat assessment doesn't change. And just to get it absolutely clear, uh, ACC, specifically those concerns about paramilitary involvement, were those related to PSNI by Mid and East Borough Council? They were. They were. Yeah. And, and, and as I say, we, 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 we run our our threat and intelligence um, assessment, and, and that it didn't change. Right. Uh, thank you for that. And just just a couple of other things. Now, they've already been touched on by by other members of the committee, but um, the the mayor uh, now, I have to say, juxtaposed with the evidence we received from two other councils, this seems to be widely at variance uh, because they they reported a very good working relationship and good comms with with the PSNI right throughout all this period. Um, but uh, juxtaposed to that, the, the mayor did say he was critical of the, the PSNI and that they had to chase the chief constable's office 
regarding the risk assessment. And then, as he went on to say, that um, the, the mayor um, felt badly cut down by the PS9 this whole episode. He referred to lack of communication, lack of transparency throughout, and he was truly disappointed by that. Now, um, this is your opportunity to maybe balance that with the level of engagement there was with the council and its officials throughout this period of time. Yeah, uh, thank you for that. Um, so I think it, it is important to say that I feel as the gold commander at the time that we had a very clear strategy around engagement, both through the partners meetings um, uh, that I've outlined earlier, uh, those chaired by DERA, those partners meetings ran by ourselves. Um, at local level, and I do know that there were a number of conversations between uh, the district commander and Mid East Antrim Council um, throughout this period, specifically the period sort of late January into early February around these concerns. We had, um, as agreed and as I've outlined, put on reassurance patrols. There, there is, and there does seem to have been a misunderstanding around the police's role in what is a threat assessment and what is a risk assessment. So we provide the threat assessment. It is for the employer, i.e. either the council, uh, DERA or UK Border Force to provide, to carry out the risk assessment. We help with that by providing crime prevention officers. We help with that by um, uh, personnel from our security branch um, doing on the ground assessments and with portal, uh, the, the portal authorities as well. Um, uh, and, and that is, as I said earlier, but the layering up of security. Then there are the reassurance patrols that we put on, both to deal with any potential protest uh, to liaise on that front and take any action we deem necessary, and to deal with criminality, to prevent it, to intervene, and um, which they did to call in with, with various members of staff at the various courts um, and provide that reassurance. Uh, and, and we have had very strong feedback um, from, from the rest of our partners about how successful that was. So can you give me an insight into this? Because this, obviously, it's, it's uh, rather new to me, this structure, the partner meetings. Um, what's the composition of them and how frequently would they meet? Say, for example, over this period of time, there may be a requirement for increased frequency. And what level of uh, seniority of your personnel would participate in those? So the, the partners meetings, um, so as I say, first, first and foremost, and most importantly, the portal arrangements were being led on by DERA. Um, so the SPS uh, uh, meetings chaired by the Permanent Secretary um, were, were, were running um, on a month, monthly basis, uh, I believe, um, from, from June through to December. And we attended every one of those and provided our insight into what we felt um, the issues were and what we anticipated. Um, we then, if you if you step it down the level, if you like, we had senior representatives from UK Border Force, Immigration, Belfast Harbour Police um, at our partners meeting and DERA, um, who were the lead agency for the SPS checks to understand how that would, that would work. Part of that is around us anticipating protest or any disruption to the critical infrastructure, how we might then want to communicate with those who were carrying out checks, whether or not, if you like, those checks could be dialed up or down to keep uh, goods flowing and things like that to ensure that goods were getting through. If we saw that sort of very critical type scenario, which we didn't see and we had no intelligence in around the time to, see, to, to indicate that, but, but these are contingency measures you'll understand. At the same time as that, district colleagues, so. Um, where, who, who were the bronze leads, if you like, in our gold, silver, bronze. So we have a silver in each district, one in Belfast, one in Larne, one in Newry and Moore, and one in yeah. Dyson. Yeah, sorry, Mark, I'm sorry for interrupting, and I, and I know you're well acquainted with what these terminologies mean, but maybe just for, for the rest of us, maybe you aren't so attuned to, we know what the colours mean, but we don't know what in practicality it means. So forgive me. Uh, the, the, so, so basically, it's a gold, silver, bronze structure, um, uh, which is strategic, tactical, and operational. Um, so uh, we set the strategy at the gold level, and we're responsible for things like ensuring we have the resources available, we have communications, um, and, and the general overall strategy. 
Um, at the tactical level, then that plan is created for each uh, a bespoke plan for each of, of the areas. So Lauren, Belfast, New England, Dallas, and uh, Foil Court. Then at a, a layer below that, on the ground, you will have a bronze commander, and they will work within parameters set by Silver who work to the gold strategy. That's our way, and, and, and members will be familiar with this from public order and, 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 and other, uh, other, other operations. Um, the bronze commanders on the ground have very strong liaison with partners, with employees, and that's around explaining why we're there and providing that uh, reassurance. At the silver level, then, we have ongoing communication with the local authorities, with, with each of the councils. As we move through uh, early January, we are continuing with our weekly partners meetings. Um, at, on the 27th of January, we held a meeting with those members who, who, who I've outlined. On the 2nd of February, I felt that actually tensions were at a point, concern by local councils were at a point that it was important that around the table we had local council members represented. Um, we also had at that meeting representation from the Northern Ireland Office and DOJ. Um, the Executive Office had asked for representation there. I can't remember off the top of my head whether or not they, 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 they were able to join in time. And it's because of that that I, I was very clear that this was not a strategic coordinating group, which I mentioned earlier, which is part of the Northern Ireland Civil Contingencies arrangements, because I didn't feel we needed to call that. Uh, and certainly wasn't sharing it in that way. But it was it was a meeting so that we could share awareness, I could share our view of, of the threat, um, and we could talk through the mitigations that we needed to do. It was really clear at that meeting that employers were concerned, their employees were concerned, not because of the threat assessment that we were providing, but because of the ongoing uh, issues on the ground, the graffiti, um, that was emerging both in terms of ports uh, around Northern Ireland Protocol and around DEP members' offices elsewhere. So I think, and it's important that we recognise those things. They are separate, but they both feed into the overall picture. And I've been very clear, uh, as I say, throughout all my discussions with partners, with the Northern Ireland Affairs Committee, with the House of Lords Committee and in the media, that those two things, whilst they are different, they feed into the same picture and impact upon employees. It was then discussed at that meeting that um, um, you know, the, the employers would be undertaking risk assessments, which are separate from a threat assessment. Um, that is a risk assessment about how you mitigate the, that environment for employees. And I undertook to provide that threat assessment as soon as possible. And as we've heard today, that, that was provided two days later, uh, which was as, 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 as quickly as we could turn it around. Just on one final, I don't expect you to have this, but it would be helpful just to or to ourselves, given the, um, we'll call it the claims made uh, around it, the uh, connectivity between the PSNI and uh, the East Island Borough Council, if we had some uh, indication or some detail around, if you like, the frequency of communication that uh, would it be silver level with, with the council, uh, if you can provide that uh, to us, I know that would be great, if that's okay, Chair. And um, that, that's all I ask you today. Anyway, thank you. Patsy, maybe maybe I can talk slightly to that and address one of your previous points about if I successfully moved the camera. Yeah, I have. Um, it, it was just really on that point you talked about in terms of balance and connectivity. And I think it's just worthy of note that that call and the conversation that kind of kicks off this uh, issue of concern between Mid and East Antrim Council and the district commander. It's worth noting that actually the district commander was off. He was on annual leave, he was off that weekend, but he was still contactable for the uh, chief executive. He took her calls on the Saturday, and in fact, there were multiple contacts over the course of that weekend where the district commander seeks to provide reassurance and advice to the chief executive for her staff. And indeed, that contact continued then right through on the 1st and 2nd of February. So there were multiple contacts, I think, and Donica yourself described eight contacts between Midney Stamprum Council and the police during that period. And from the evidence that we've seen and the conversations that we've had with Michael Simpson, it's very clear that there was a regular and ongoing dialogue throughout that period with, with, throughout that period with police attempting to provide reassurance and advice to Mid-East Antrim Council. Sorry, Michael Simpson being the local superintendent down there, is it? 
That's correct, yes. Yeah. So he, as Mark has set out, you know, the, the district commander would have a role in terms of interfacing with the local council, not just on these matters, but obviously in, in wider policing issues as well. So those are well-established relationships. And Michael was a contactable by and did provide her with reassurance and, and came back to her a number of times over the, the forthcoming three or four days. Okay, thanks very much for that. Okay. Okay, thank you, uh, Patsy. So I'm just taking over the chair and was next in line uh, to ask a question anyway, so I'm not abusing uh, my, my position. Uh, ju just in terms of the terms of reference uh, of the committee, I mean, just quickly, it, it, some of it is to deal with, you know, how dear and relevant local authorities gather, assessed and reported on alleged threats. You know, another part is consider the difference in approach between the councils and the rationale to remove and maintain staff at the ports. Uh, and, and lastly, establishing what consideration was given by Deere and Mid and East Andrum Council to the PSNI assessments of the threat and deciding to withdraw. Uh, and just before I ask my question on those terms of reference, I, I suppose I should put uh, on, on record that uh, as an, a constituency MLA which covers Mid and East Andrum, I have had conversations both at district level and with AC McEwen uh, on this issue in the aftermath of the decision. But in terms of the sort of uh, going back to the terms of reference of what the inquiry is about, so I mean, there, there's an issue with Deira, Mid and East Antrim, Belfast, Derry, uh, Newry, and Morn, and I've probably left somebody out. Uh, w w did the PSNA have any difference in the service that they provided to? any of those councils you know was was there special treatment uh given to any of the councils or the department over and above others in terms of uh, access to meetings access to information returning of phone calls or indeed the information that was provided on the risk assessment of, of any of the staff no i can be unequivocal in that uh, chair uh, absolutely not there's no, no difference in terms of the information provided, access to, to partners' meetings or, or, or any of that. I've, I've outlined at length the, the arrangements that were in place. Where there may be a difference is in terms of what the local patrolling might look like, what uh, th that, you know, and, and we, put, we put significant resource into Larne and Belfast, um, probably a lower level in Newry and Bourne. And, uh, and again, a lower level at foil court because it's, it's a different type of court. So, so the interactions, the engagement, the, 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 that is all consistent. However, the outworkings of that will, will be guided by what we see to be the, the, the threat at the time and then what we feel the local uh, need is in terms of providing that reassurance. So I, I mean, I would need to look at the, the hours spent effectively between Belfast and Lauren, there, there may be a slight difference there, but it's suffice to say that I, I understand, uh, as, as uh, my colleague has said, there was, there was significant interaction uh, with the local district commander and um, the Northampton Council. And I know that he has briefed into the PCSP the, the level of resource that we put in around the port, which was, was uh, to provide reassurance. Okay, I mean, we have established uh... Well, it's been put on record uh, that you know the, the, by other members of, there was a, a, an issue made about the concern of Mid and East Antrim that that they weren't uh, invited to attend the goals command meeting, which you have now said they were never going to be uh, attending because of an internal matter. So they obviously had some confusion of their role uh, and indeed the role of goal command. You, you have also explained that they had obviously some kind of misinterpretation or misconception of the difference between uh, a risk assessment and a threat assessment. Uh, can I ask, do, wh what was provided to Mid and East Andrum Council then in the aftermath of them making the decision to allow them to return staff? Was that an, a written threat assessment? So there was a written threat assessment sent to all the members of that partners meeting that came together on the 2nd of February. That meeting then still exists today. It's held weekly and is, it still has representation from the councils from other partners, including uh, HMRC, um, Immigration, UK Border Force, Belfast, Harbour Police, um, and DERA, okay. obviously. Um, so that, that written threat assessment is provided um, uh, to, to all of those members in addition to that, then, 
And again, this is provided at local level. Um, and throughout this, even throughout the, the arrangements being planned, uh, particularly through DERA, around the SPS checks, we, um, as, a, 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 as we ordinarily would, uh, provided crime prevention advice. So we have officers who are specialists who go down to look at the site and advise on things that we may do to layer up security and, and provide reassurance to employees. And in addition to that, although we wouldn't ordinarily do it, our own security branch here primarily focused on looking after um, our own estate. We, we, we um, uh, provided specialist advice from them as well to our partners. So I need to check the actual record, but I do know that in the planning and the run up to this, um, that advice was given and it continued to be provided to all the councils and to all the partners uh, uh, throughout this period. So, I mean, despite many Andrew talking about a risk assessment being required and then given, no, that wasn't the case, it was a threat assessment. Yeah, we did, we did, we did articulate that um, to the Mid-East Standard Council. I can't recall if any other partner asked for a risk assessment. Um, so we were asked questions like, um, is it safe for employees to go back to work? That is a question that we wouldn't answer directly. We provide the threat assessment, what the overall threat is. We then, um, as I say, lent in to help with the risk assessment. Um, it's, it's to be led by the employer, it's not for police to do. We wouldn't do it in, in any circumstances for another employer, that's for them to do. Uh, but we do provide advice and, and help on that. And, and in terms of that, did, when that was provided to Mid and East Andrew Council, uh, did, did, was there a caveat that it shouldn't be, that that information shouldn't be provided to members? I mean, because I, I, mean, I asked the, the chief executive at the, at the last meeting and she said that, it, you know, the PSNI, I think, now I, I don't want to misquote her, I know it wasn't uh, given, the information wasn't provided to members uh, and, and I think it was because she said that, that the PSNI said that it shouldn't be. So the, the, threat, or the risk assessment is a matter for the council, so that's owned by the council. The threat assessment was provided to partners. It was marked official sensitive partners under the government marking scheme, the protective marking scheme that we're all subject to. So it's for the council um, to, to within that uh, framework to decide how to share it. Yeah, but I mean, councils being uh, run uh, uh, as democratic institutions by councillors, there's no reason why they, they wouldn't be afforded that information. I, 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 can't, I can't see why they wouldn't, but, but I don't want to interpret the meaning of other people, um, because actually most of what was in that threat assessment I have said publicly anyhow, um, but it, it is provided to partners under the government marking scheme and it's for them to decide how to implement that. Yeah, and, and just and just finally, I mean, because you, you've kind of raised the point, so you, you put on record at the NI Affairs Committee, I think it was a week before the 2nd of February, roughly a week, that, you know, your assessment of, of uh, within loyalism in terms of graffiti and, and uh, uh, social media activity. There was eight conversations between Mid and East Antrim Council and the PSNI at various levels, whether it was yourself and District Command, you know, uh, uh, and even on the day prior to it in terms of contact. At no point, you, you know, did you feel that you hadn't all the information? You know, people here have talked about uh, allegations of paramilitary activity, about number plate taken, uh, of different things. So, I mean, you're satisfied that you were aware of all the information that Mid -East, Mid East Antrim had, and your assessment was that the threat was low. Yes. Um, uh, I mean, I can't. I can't second guess various things, but we, we're satisfied that we did everything we could to establish all the information that, that we believe was there, um, to take that information in, to assess it, uh, and provide it to that assessment. I mean, have you any? I mean, have you any rationale for why you know some local authorities believed your assessment, and other authorities thought that they knew better uh, and 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 didn't, uh, or thought they knew better than your assessment? I think there's, and I go back to this point around the threat assessment itself, and our view of uh, working with with partners and the intelligence that we have, um, and then the the other information that may perhaps come to individuals, whether it's in Midlands Standard Council or elsewhere, um, any of that that was reported to us, we then assessed it. Um, a number of those pieces of information we uh, graded as unsubstantiated, uncorroborated. It didn't fundamentally 
change the overall threat assessment, and, and, and that was our organisational position. And just finally, because uh, it has been alluded to by other members, I mean, the chief executive of Mid East Antrim was aware that your assessment was that there was no paramilitary, loyalist paramilitary activity involved, and she was aware of that certainly prior to the Mid East Antrim Council making their decision. And uh, can I just clarify if she was aware of it prior to the 30th of January, which she wrote to uh, the British Cabinet Office? Uh, well, I, I, I can answer that, Chair. Um... So I, I can tell you what I have done and the statements I have made and the information we've provided to partners, but if she was aware of it, it would be a question for her. Sorry, I, I mean, I maybe asked that wrong. She was aware that the police assessment was that there was no loyalist paramilitary involvement. Well, I, I can say that that was our assessment. That's our organisational position. I know that Superintendent Simpson um, was aware of that and had conveyed that um, to Midney Sandrum Council. Okay, thank you. Thanks very much, uh, gentlemen. Uh, I'll just check now. William, you're next. Thank you, Vice Chair, and I can thank the gentlemen for their presentation. Uh, given those high levels of tension, there's graffiti, gra graffiti on the walls and all the rest, you do say that the threat from the wireless paramilitaries was low. Uh, you didn't say there was no threat. Is that right? So I said that the activities that we saw and the tensions that existed, it was our assessment that they were not being driven by loyalist paramilitaries. I have continually said um, that uh, both to partners, to in, in, you know, in evidence to committees and publicly, that, that that there is a separate issue then, that does not rule out the actions of individuals. We saw graffiti, we saw the rising tensions, so, so those, are, those are separate things. So we... In effect, police or yourselves couldn't say there was absolutely no threat. Is that right? So the threat assessment came through to describe the involvement of loyalist paramilitaries, but it does then take into account and, and setting aside that that element of the threat assessment, what I've said is what was causing disquiet um, and uh, concern to employees and subsequently to employers was the ongoing tensions that we could see, um, the, the graffiti that was, that was appearing and, and those sorts of activities. Yeah, that there was there was always always a risk that individuals could could do something. Is that right? And that kind of brings me to the heart of the matter in terms of the difference between a threat assessment and the risk assessment, and, and we've covered that in terms of the mitigations that we would put in place um, following a formal risk assessment by employers for for placing that as largely down to advice and also some reassurance and high visibility patrol. Okay, listen, that's okay. Thank you. Okay, uh, Morris. Thank you, Chair. Uh, and good morning, gentlemen. Uh, thank you very much for coming in front of the committee again uh, this week. I, 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 I raised an issue with uh, Chief Superintendent Singleton last time. Uh, the, the perceived threat to uh, a port member, uh, and I raised that with the Chief Executive and the Mayor when we met them as well, and they said yes, there was a, a threat to a port worker, and the port worker had been relocated under under various legislations, uh, which was that variance of what I'd been told the week before. So really, I'm looking for some clarification. Uh, was there a, a worker at, at, at the port, uh, any port, had to be rehoused in a secure location following a threat to his life. Uh, a customs officer was targeted in February, according to my reports, around the same time as that menacing graffiti and so on started to appear around the ports. Uh, the worker reported it to the police, I'm told. We found it credible. Uh, and it was also reported in various news outlets uh, as the first time a relocation had happened through a terrorist targeting since 2011. Uh, you state clearly there is no paramilitary involvement in threats or disruptive behaviour, but there was tensions uh, in and around the port, and there were tensions in and around the country. That is a threat assessment rather than a risk assessment. Do you think that the Council acted properly in assessing the risk to their staff? So, there's a number of questions in there. Um, let me deal with the threat to the portal worker, uh, first of all. 
we were aware of a low level unsubstantiated uncorroborated threat towards a member of staff working for one of our partners and that's as, as far as i'm going to say in that and um, it did not reach the threshold um, for schemes such as the sped scheme now what an employer decides to do to support their employees is a matter for them what i am saying is quite clearly that there was i am aware of a threat to a, a an employee of a partner what we did it as unsubstantiated and uncorroborated and, and a, a low level of threat um, it would not have met the threshold for for example the sped scheme which i think is the one the members alluding to um, i do agree and, and I, i've said publicly on a number of occasions including today there were tensions there were, were considerable community tensions that will vary from area to area um, and, and the the graffiti that we see in the outwork are the outworkings of those tensions so it's understandable that employees are perhaps nervous um, the risk assessment um, I, i've described the difference between the threat and the risk assessment and i've described what we do and where our role is in that uh, it wouldn't be for me i wouldn't be qualified to, to say whether or not i believe um, that the risk assessment was was or, 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 or was right or, or, or otherwise and um, that's a matter for the employer whether that's the council one of our other partner agencies to undertake themselves and to work through with their employees and their unions and, and, and whoever else we, we will of course help in terms of uh, advice around the layers of security that you can provide and our, our reassurance patrol mm -hmm. thanks very much for that uh I, I wasn't trying to be specific, which is why I never mentioned the SPED program. I didn't want to get into any, any individual information or anything like that, however, but thanks very much for that. But you, you made quite a point about the rising tension in and around Larne and other areas in Northern Ireland at the time. Uh, if, we, if you were of an opinion that there were no threats, why, why did you increase patrols and men on the ground uh, if that was not a reaction to a threat or, or a threat of violence or a threat of disruption. Uh, in your words, uh, you had significant resources in Larnport. Why would you do this if there was no threat or perceived threat? Well, I, I think you've been pretty clear on that. So the threat assessment um, referring to the involvement of loyalist paramilitaries, we, 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 we've dealt with at the museum here today. Yeah. Um, but as I say, as we work through a risk assessment, so if you're the employer you look at things about what's the physical environment for that employee are they working alone are they working with other colleagues are there other people in the vicinity do you have cctv and the one thing that we can do as the police in that scenario is provide reassurance now whilst uh, we've talked about the threat assessment we also are aware that criminal damage um, and by way of graffiti was taking place in fact there were three arrests for criminal damage in car uh, or sorry in Lard. um so 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 we were there primarily that patrolling was provided to try and prevent that sort of criminal behavior to intervene where possible and to provide reassurance to employees so that they would see and know that police were were in the in the vicinity because of that that sort of tense environment yeah thanks very much for that and, and just as a, as a reminder I, I never mentioned the word paramilitary i i, I concentrated on threats and threat of violence and perceived threats. I didn't actually mention any organizations or anything like that, so I just want to make that clear. Also, we, we are in a position of hindsight. We're trying to sift our way through this evidence, having uh, the knowledge of it's already happened, and we're trying to di dissect it and disseminate it amongst ourselves to see what actually happened and what was the reasons leading up to the decision to remove the officials. So it's clear that, to me, there was a threat. There was uh, an issue of the safety of workmen, uh, and any employer that doesn't take the safety of their employees seriously, uh, there's something badly wrong. Uh, and I think that when we get to the nuts and the bolts of this investigation, that will come across clear. But listen, thank you very much. In the meantime, I'll, I'll, I'll maybe think of something up. Okay. Okay. Thanks, Morris. Uh, Claire. Thanks, Chair. I um, just want to thank um, you for being with us here again today and also thank ACC Singleton for your clarification to my question the last time you were with us. Much appreciated. Um, I'm looking at...
the the letter that um this chief executive of the Dublin council was sent to the cabinet office on the 30th stating then that um, she believed there was paramilitary involvement. With Sorry, him. Claire. Could, could members please mute? There's a, it sounds like there's a white man working in the background. Could members please mute uh, who aren't speaking? Okay. Okay. Good to go. Right. So we, we know, and the pace and I have been very clear the whole way through that um, that their assessment was that there was no paramilitary involvement and. You're saying yourselves that you've conveyed this information a number of times to Mid East Antrim between the 30th of January and the 1st of February. And then we know that the letter was sent on the 30th, stating that there was paramilitary involvement, um, and that came from the chief executive of the council. Um, and when we had an evidence session with the Mid East Antrim council mayor and chief executive, um, and again, this is not a verbatim quote. Um, so, but I, I think what they were saying to us was that a number of councillors had raised with them um, that they believed that there was paramilitary involvement and that they took their lead from them because they know what's happening on the ground. Um, so, I just on the back of that, uh, did any councillor at Mid East Antrim ever raise concerns with the? PSNI or share that level of knowledge with yourselves? So, to the best of my knowledge, they didn't. Um, certainly, as the Chief Executive has described, on the 30th of January, she did contact Superintendent Simpson and she relayed from the back she had her. Sorry, there's a bit of a bit. Could all members please put their, uh, their, their computers if they're not speaking, please? Thank you, Chair. So I was just clarifying that Superintendent Simpson did speak to the Chief Executive on the 30th of January, and it was at that point that the Chief Executive told um, Superintendent Simpson that mm -hmm. she had been advised by elected representatives of this potential issue or threat. Um, and then later that day, uh, Superintendent Simpson was able to confirm that PSNI were aware of the same anonymous information that had been provided. Thanks for that. And can I then ask you, what would be the recommended advice under such circumstances? You know, if an elected rep fear that staff are under a paramilitary threat, is that something that really should be signposted directly to the PSNI, or should that go to a council official? Uh, ideally, we would ask that it's provided directly to the police, but we're recognising certain circumstances that people can do that for a number of reasons. Um, they may have, you know, for example, a fear of retribution or, or something of that nature. So there are alter alternative means of people providing information to the police in those circumstances that you'll be aware of, the likes of crime stoppers. So it would be, ideally, it would be the case that we would ask them to speak to officers, but we understand that in certain circumstances, people don't feel comfortable or able to do that. Um, and in terms of our response to that, again, um, we're very clearly Superintendent Simpson tried to do all he could to provide reassurance and further advice to the council in respect of the information that they brought forward. Right, thanks. And then just a wee last one. So I remember there was one sort of time that uh, my staff and I were sort of informed that there could be a bit of a threat against us in our office. Uh, and at that time, the police um, came forward and gave us all personal safety training, um, or offered it at least, if it was willing. Were the staff affected in this case ever um, offered that personal safety training, or did the council come and ask if you would be able to provide that? Well, I do know from the correspondence that I've seen that there was direct contact again between Michael Simpson and um, other members of the council, specifically around the issue of crime prevention advice, and that was discussed over the course of the days following them, the, the 30th of January. And that was in addition to uh, what ACC Meet has talked about in terms of the general advice that was provided to the partners through the Gold Group as well. Great. And the partner. Great. Cheers. Okay, thank you. Rosemary, you're looking in for a question? Rosemary? Just take some time. Oh. Yes, just, just one question, and it's in relation to graffiti. 
Was there quite a lot of graffiti appearing at Lar Larne Harbour even before that particular weekend? Can you advise? Um, as it appeared, was it kept continually? There was it kept continually being removed by the council. Uh, yes. So uh, I, I mean, I, I don't have the specifics in front of me, but what what I could say is we started to see an increase of the incidents of uh, incidences of, of graffiti, uh, both in Larne, in Belfast, elsewhere in the country, frankly. And I know specifically at some uh, DUP uh, offices, uh, and that ranged uh, uh, around, you know, the, the protocol, the Good Friday Agreement, uh, and, and other things. So, but yes, as is, as is the case, um, working with all the councils where it appeared, um, as soon as possible, we, we had it removed. Yeah, and it was the PSNI had it removed, or was it the council, or in cooperation with both? It would be in cooperation with both, but it's the council. It's the council who, who do the actual removal. Yeah, uh -huh. that's okay. No, everything else is clear. Yeah, that's fine. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Rosemary. Okay, and I've no mem other, no further members uh, looking to ask questions. So I'd like to take the the opportunity now to uh, thank you, um, <coughs> the ACC Singleton and McEwen, for attending here today. Um, thank you very much. And can I get agreement from the committee to add the PSNA briefing paper to the committee's um, website? Great. Okay, members. Uh, we're going to move on now uh, to um, item eight. Um, it's a departmental written briefing on the horse racing amendment bill, delegated parish memorandum. I want to refer members to the correspondence from the department of page 93, alongside the delegated parish memorandum. One advice member that the bill contains only one delegated power, that of amending the definition of a horse race course operator by regulations. The department has advised that procedure uh, draft affirmative is considered appropriate as it will give adequate opportunity to consider any proposed amendments as delegated powers amends primary legislation. A member is okay to note this here, and we can we will uh, will actually be revisiting this whenever the committee starts looking at the um, scrutiny of this bill. Okay, can I get agreement to publish this on the website? Okay, thank you, um, members. Um, item nine on the today's agenda is the uh, written briefing on the agricultural fees student fees amendment regulations 2021. I want to refer members to correspondence from the department at page 97. Uh, I want to advise members that the rule will be laid before the assembly under the negative resolution procedure and is anticipated that it will come into operation on the 1st of August 2021. The purpose of the regulations is to apply an increase uh, to tuition fees paid by full-time eligible students attending courses of higher education delivered at Caffrey. The fees will increase from 1325 to 1785 per annum. Um, in cases where a reduced fee is paid, uh, and in cases where a reduced fee is paid from 8.45 to 8.70, there will be no charge to the fee of 9,250 9, for, for full-time students from England, Scotland, Wales, the Isle of Man, and the Channel Islands. The regulations will also apply uh, changes that will ensure that the correct tuition fee charge is levied against students not ordinarily resident here, here following the uh, exit from the EU. Students from the South, under the terms of the Common Travel Area Policy, will pay a tuition fee of 17.85, which is similar to a student or ordinarily uh, domiciled here. Following consultation on tuition fees in 2012, the Department indicated that it was the intention to maintain parity with DFE by applying an annual inflationary increase to the fee in line with the basic fee struck by DFE, and this decision has been upheld ever since. The DRFE increases more, increases more legislative amounts set by the Department for Economy uh, in the Student Fees Amounts uh, Regulations, uh, NA 2020, SR 2020 no. 98, which will come into operation on the 1st of September 2021. Um, do members uh, want to uh, comment on this here? Um, the, the one thing um, I, I, I want to... Uh, I want to just raise about this here, and maybe uh, if members would agree to get some clarification from the from the uh, department on this. Is that obviously this is a Brexit issue, and it may well have implications for EU students. The number of EU students coming coming here, 
uh, whilst it's whilst it is whilst the fact that the students in the north and the, and the south and uh, across in Britain and um, our part and parts of the UK um, r r fees remain the same. That does not appear to be the case for for other EU students from across the EU. And I'm very conscious that um, I'm conscious that that could have a potential, potential impact on the footfall of the Caffrey Colleges, and I'm very very conscious that um, a lot of the people employed here in the industry, the agri-food industry, are people who aren't originally from here. So I think, could we just um, maybe, if it was your agreement, maybe raise some of these concerns with the department um, on the impact this would have for um, students um, across the EU uh, and in terms of um, and what, uh, what impact it might have on the footfall uh, and on the registrations uh, of students in CAFRE, you know, given that the, 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 the increase in the, uh, the, the, it, will, it, will, it will have a detrimental impact on them. Okay. Members okay with that? Yep. Okay. Um, okay. So, members can tap the merits of the policy move, and it moves to the next legislative stage. Okay, members, item 10 is a uh, written briefing, statutory instrument AGS 006, the common market, the uh, common organisation of the markets and agricultural products, fruit and vegetable producer organisations, tariff quotas and wine amendment, etc. Regulations 2021. I will refer members to the correspondence from the Department of Page 177. I will advise members that DEFRA is planning to lay the SA at Westminster on the 15th of May under the draft affirmative procedure and is anticipated that it will come into operation on the day after it is made. DEFRA worked with DERA and the other DAs to lay revised SAs relating to the common market organisation and geographical indications prior to the end of the transition period. Those SIs uh, were required to address operability issues in the retained EU and domestic legislation, for example, to correct previous errors to reflect updates to EU and domestic law during the intervening period and to align with provisions of the withdrawal agreement, uh, including the protocol. The committee uh, received oral briefings on two such SIs on the 24th of September and the 1st of October, uh, which were subsequently made on the 7th of December 2020. Due to an error in the commencement provisions of AGS 05 and some amendments in AGS 04, uh, they did not make, take effect. Therefore, I propose to evoke part four of AGS 05, omit the regulated AGS uh, 04 amendments, and remake all of the affected amendments in a new SA AGS uh, 006. Since no changes have been made to devolved uh, provisions previously contained in AGS 05, uh, being remade in AGS 006, Minister Pooch is content that this previous consent, the territorial extent of these provisions, um, uh, stands. Uh, stands. Um, members, any comments you want to make to that there? Or he's happy enough to note this in the usual form if we previously agreed? Okay. Okay, member, uh, members, I'm going to move on to I'm just checking the WhatsApp here to make sure that I'm. Um, not missing anyway. um, item 11 then is a written briefing, statutory instrument AG 16, the food and drink miscellaneous amendments, reg uh, mem amendments relating to food and wine, composition information and labelling, regulations 2021. Members, the correspondence in the departments is page 184 in your pack. I want to advise members this is mostly devolved. Uh, this mostly devolved SI is subject to the affirmative resolution procedure at Westminster and is anticipated that it will come into operation in May 2021. The SI makes amendments to retained direct EU legislation relating to food and wine composition, information and labelling, as well as domestic enforcement legislation. It applies in Britain, um, but not here, as we will continue to follow directly applicable EU legislation. At the, as the consent of the dear minister has not been sought and, uh, and, and is not required, this is brought to the attention of the committee for information only. Are members okay to note this? Okay. Um, the um, written briefing, Environmental Engagement Index. Uh, members, the briefing paper is at page 191. Revised to, I'm, advised, I'm asking you to forward any questions you have to the clerk by the close of play today. Um, our, M13 is a written briefing, Green Growth uh, Draft Strategy Document. That's at page 196 of your packs. 
Members will recall that this was agreed at last week's meeting to change the oral briefing to a written briefing, as there are no further updates from the Department on the draft strategy. And again, can I ask the member to forward any questions on the briefing by the close of play, play to Stella, uh, the clerk, today, uh, close of play today. Um, item 14 is a written briefing, consultation on proposed fees and charges for NA participants in the EU, UK emissions trading scheme. Uh, the written briefing is at page 231. One of the members of the department advised on the 9th of January that that it was launching uh, a consultation on proposed fees and charges for NA participants in the UK uh, emissions trading scheme. The committee considered this at this, that stage and had no concerns. Consultation was published on the 5th of February for eight weeks and closed on the 2nd of April. Stakeholders were contacted by email uh, and with a link to the consultation on the DARE website with details on how to respond. One response was received from the Mineral Products Association of Northern Ireland. Uh, this was a positive response and the association was content with the proposals as set out. DARE will now implement these fees charges. Members okay with that? Okay. Okay, I want to refer members to the correspondence. Uh, sorry, item number 15 is a uh, written briefing on the Agricultural Wages uh, Regulations Order regarding the Agricultural Wages Board. I want to refer members to the correspondence from the Department of Page 234. I want to advise members that the Minister has advised that the Committee in February that he intends to bring forward proposals for the consideration and agreement to abolish the Agricultural Wages Board. This will require a revocation uh, of the Agricultural Wages Regulations NIA Order 1977, subject to a Executive and Assembly Agreement. <coughs> the AWB comprises six members nominated by the United Union, six members from the Ulster Farmers Union, and three independent members appointed by the Minister. They meet the, the Board meets three times per year to agree annual pay rates, which are set out in the Agricultural Wages Amendment Order for the forthcoming year. Um, following abolition, uh, the agriculture sector would be subject to the, to the same employment legislation as all other sectors of the economy. The briefing provides an overview of the planned consultation and the findings of the draft equality rural needs and regulatory impact assessments. As intended, the consultation will be launched in mid-May for an eight-week period. Dairy officials will continue to engage with AWB members and, um, and with key stakeholders during this period. Um, our members any comments or are you happy enough that we request for an analysis of the consultation responses? Happy enough? Mm -hmm. right on. Getting a note from Stella here. Mm -hmm. Oh, I yeah. do that first. Okay, no problem. Okay, members, item 16 is the um, correspondence. It's a page, uh, the uh, 3347 of your packs. I want to bring to attention of the members uh, correspondence from the department at page 365, which advises seeking the views of the committee on the appointment of an NA non-executive member to the Office of Environmental Protection in advance of the Assembly's approval of commencement of the relevant provisions of the Environment Bill. Uh, can I seek uh, uh, any any um, um, comments from, from members in relation to this here? Okay. Uh, the appointment of that, I, 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 okay. um, members, um, I, I was, I was, I've been looking at this one here myself, and I was um, obviously, um, I've, I still have got questions in relation to the OEP, in relation to uh, how this um, interfaces with the proposed independent EPA, um, and indeed the north-south sort of arrangements that we have here for that type of oversight. Um, are we, um, you know, could we, I remember we happy if we could try to tease that out a bit more with the department to get some, um, get some, get some clear understanding of it? Yeah. Remember to be okay with that? Yeah, I'm right, happy enough to support that. And Chair, I just sort of also note on the, the brief from the Green Growth Strategy that there is no, it, it stated there that there's no north-south um, mm -hmm. ongoing work or, or um, potential consequences being worked on as well. So I think if that's not being thought of in the green growth and it's not being clarified within the OEP, then it is something that we need to be looking at in terms of a sustainable future, certainly. Yeah. John, 
Thank you, Claire. John, you have any kid you want to say something there? Yeah, sure. Um, the, the further information you, you referenced on the interface between the OEP and uh, an independent agency, perfectly legitimate. I get the bit that the uh, OEP would be replaced and work previously done by the Commission, and that the um, independent agency would be more, more local and public delivery based, but I still think further clarification would be um, useful. I, I would also like, uh, with, with your <clears throat> permission, Chair, if we're seeking information, to get more information on how this is being advertised and how applications are being sought. I'd be keen to see how, how that message is being put out there, if that's possible. Yeah, I think so. I think members will be content with that. Yeah. Great. Okay. See, it's one of the one of the challenges when you're doing it online. It's hard to get a consensus if you're not sitting looking at people. But I'm picking that up from I can looking at you virtually here, so that's okay. Thank you. Um, okay. Um, so members are members okay to action the uh, uh, the correspondence suggested the index sheet to page three forty seven. Okay. Um, okay, member members. I want to also under correspondence. I want to under correspondence. I want to refer members to correspondence received by John uh, from Anne Donahue dated the 22nd of April. It's tabled uh, page three. It suggests that we um, seek legal advice on this letter and whether the letter should be in the public domain, whether it is pertinent to the committee inquiry and advice on the request made by Mrs Donahue to Mr Blair. Is that members okay with that? Okay. Chair, I'm okay with that. Can, can I comment for the record at this point that I have shared this correspondence and previous correspondence referenced mm -hmm. um, in this letter on the basis of uh, my own interest and my known interest of the committee in openness and transparency? Thank you, John. Chair. Yes, Philip. Sure. So, so, I mean, I, I, I would propose that I mean, the, the letter be published along with all other correspondence and that we seek... seek uh, Clarification, just on relation to its contents. I mean, I, I don't see any reason why the letter itself shouldn't be published. Uh, I do think that that we should seek uh, further clarification on on the contents of the letter. But I would propose that the letter itself is published. Okay. Can I suggest we just seek legal advice to be sure? We should yeah. be able to get that pretty quick. But it's up to the committee. Yeah. Um, Philip, would you be content if we held fire on that until we sought legal advice on that matter? I mean, I mean, the the letter was written uh, from the chief executive of Mid East Antrim Council, and Mid East Antrim Council had a paper. So I mean, I don't see any reason why uh, somebody in that position wouldn't uh, expect the letter to be made public. But I mean, I mean, I'm happy enough that we take advice on. Well, if there's a, uh, John, did you, you, John, is that you looking in again, John? No, or is that an no, old? It's not, but I'm happy to be seek the advice, and I think that's appropriate. Okay. And we we publish pending that advice. Thank you, thank you. Okay, members. Um, okay, we're going to move on then to the forward work program, uh, page three seventy. I want to advise members that the department has advised that the lead official for the briefing on the nature friendly farming due for the thirteenth of May is unavailable due to a previous dairy commitment, and I suggest that the twentieth of May as an alternative date. Are members okay with that? Okay. I want to advise members that from next week, committee staff will take on the responsibility of moderating the Starleaf meeting. This means that they uh, that they will be controlling the witnesses in and out of the spotlight as well as members. This is a function usually carried out by the Assembly Broadcasting, which has been passed uh, to committees to do. I was okay to note that. Can I uh, seek agreement for the Forward Brook programme? Okay. Can I just? Sorry, Stella. Can I suggest that we have about 20 minutes? We see if we can, we can deal. There was one matter that we didn't get dealt with, which was the work plan for climate change. Right. And we might just want to take 20 minutes and see can we get through it? Yeah. Is it, is it on the today? Can we? It was a, it's at the under matters arising in closed session. So. What number? In the, yeah. What number on the? Yeah. I, I'm just getting it now. So. Do you remember. It's, um, it's at um, page 21 of the, of the main pack. 21 of the main pack. Members, um, I want to just refer you back here to page 21 of the main pack, which is to do with the planning for the committee stage of the climate change bill. Okay. Um, 
Yeah. Don't reset the chairs, brief. Stella. Just go to oh, it's the, item the page two. three of the chairs. Uh, item two, isn't it? Yeah. Okay, members, we'll just go just go back to page two now before we commence the twelve o'clock briefing um, session. Uh, it's, num it's, it's, it's item number two: consideration of the the work plan for the climate change bill. Uh, the memo from the clerk is at page twenty-one. Uh, Stella, do you want to brief the committee, and um, and I can also welcome the bill clerk for the climate change committee, Barbara. Yeah, I'm not sure that she's had, she yeah. would have gone on, but yeah, but still, uh, do you want to brief the committee? Then? Yeah, uh -huh. members, you'll be aware that a private members' bill has been introduced to the assembly on climate change. It's to have its second reading. It's on the order paper for the 10th of May. We did receive a briefing from the private member who's the main sponsor on that bill last week. <clears throat> Thereafter. From the 11th of May, it will be referred to the Airwick Committee for the committee stage of its legislative passage. So, as I mentioned previously on the horse racing bill, and those of you who have done primary legislation before, um, committee stage involves detailed consideration of the bill, clause by clause consideration of the bill. The committee would, and I'm basing this on what we would normally do for an executive bill, we would not take a different approach for a private member's bill. So the committee normally takes evidence from interested bodies, including the government departments that are involved, and from appropriate individuals. And the aim of gathering that evidence is to inform policy and members on the policy implications of the bill and to allow different and various aspects of the bill to be aired and discussed. Committee members scrutinise each clause. Sorry, there's somebody... Um, doing some work outside the window here, um, and we'll discuss possible amendments or proposals for it. Sorry, can I ask staff to ask security to stop the workmen outside the committee um, window, please? Um, so, understanding Order 33-2, when the bill comes to this committee on the, more than likely, assuming it passes, second stage debate, um, that will be the 11th of uh, May, and we'll have 30 working days um, to consider, take evidence, um, look at the provisions of the bill, do the clause by clause, and write a report. And a bill this complex is a framework bill. Framework bills are generally more complex, will need more than 30 days. So, again, you're more than likely going to seek an extension of the committee stage into late autumn, and when I mean late autumn, it'll be into December, more than likely. Um, so the committee need to agree a timetable for its consideration of the bill um, and consult in consultation with the bill office and with the member who sponsored the bill. And both the member who sponsored the bill has seen the first draft of this version of this timetable and so has the bill office. So you will need to look at placing a public notice for your call of evidence, uh, the consideration of an assembly research paper, evidence uh, sessions from stakeholders. You need to allow sufficient time for stakeholders to receive an invitation, consider the requests that have been made of them and draft a response. You need to look at the scrutiny of the delegated powers and uh, look at your deliberations and formal clause by clause, including if you want to formulate and agree on any amendments that need to be tabled for further consideration stage. So the public notice will be placed in the regional newspapers um, and it will signpost people to the committee webpage and signpost people to, so, um, to social media. And just to point out, committees do not do a public consultation, as you would understand, under Section 75 of the Northern Ireland Act. We do a call for evidence on the bill. That's what it's formally called. Um, so we are going proposing to use citizen space for the call for evidence. Okay. And we're asking you that to agree that the, the committee staff will draw up a public notice. We'll bring that back to you next week for your approval. And assuming that's approved, that will go into the papers the week after. So we'll be directing people to use citizen space for their um, responses to the committee. Citizen space is a digital platform. It is used by government, it's used by local government, it's used by the Welsh and Scots parliaments. It's been used once before by a committee here, but because we're only back up and running for a while, this will be the first time um, that we um, are using it in any, in any great extent here. But it should allow um, the committee to fully um, 
integrate and interrogate the information that comes out of its call for evidence. Then the committee will also look at the scrutiny of delegated powers um, in a departmental bill that is done by the department. Um, that is going to be done by the examiner statutory rules for this bill. And other particular scrutiny points that you might need to look at would be the financial implications of the bill and the compliance regime attached to the bill. So I do have a list of stakeholders at Appendix A of this memo. And I'm going to ask you if, um, to look at Appendix A of the memo and decide whether there are further people that need to be added to that. So that is page 26 of your pack, Appendix A. Uh, list of potential stakeholders and I've listed down there whether we will be bringing these people um, asking them to give uh, um, oral or written evidence using the citizen space. So mm -hmm. if you want to have a look at that list and let me know if there is um, anybody further that you want to add to that list. Um, you can do it now or if you so wish you can get a response into me by close the play today and then I'll bring the final list back to the committee for approval. Hmm? Chagas. Chagas, okay, yes. So the chair has asked that Chagas be added to the list. Chagas, for those members who maybe um, aren't aware, are the, roughly the equivalent to AFB in the uh, Republic of Ireland. Okay, so again, close up here today. Have a look at that list. Sorry. Can I, add? Sure, can, I, can I suggest very quickly, I'm not going along the list, it may be there, I'm still looking over this, um, Environment Link be contacted also? They are there, That's John. Wrong. In fact, I've got them down to come for oral evidence. Can I, can I ask um, Rosemary here, can I ask for the Climate Change Committee, please? Yeah, they are. Yes, we have them down as well, Rosemary. Okay. And again, they're down to give oral evidence. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Okay. Can I ask for Professor John Sweeney? Professor He's a legal climate scientist from Maynooth. John Sweeney from Maynooth. Okay, um, University. Claire, um, do you yeah. want to bring them yeah. in as oral or written? Um, I prefer oral, but I'm um, having a look at the timetable as you finalise it all. I will, Claire, I'll come back to you to see whether where we can squeeze them in or whether whether um, a written submission would be best. I'll have a look at that and come back to you. Sure. Okay. So um, if that's okay, again, with the, the, the list of stakeholders, there's been no objections to adding those um, those those three, two additional um, takers and, and professional John Sweeney. I'll, I'll look at those and come back to see where we can put them in. Um, but remember, again, as you go along, members, you know, this is your opportunity to ask for people on the list because I'm going to form a timetable around this list. And once the timetable is set and we've extended the committee stage, it cannot be re-extended. You have one shot at this. Okay. Members can also... I suggest, uh, if we're, can, we, can I suggest, given the fact that you know, we, we do share a, 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 a land border with, with our jurisdiction on the same island, that we look at, uh, ask the IFA as well? IFA? Yeah. Irish Farmers Association? Yeah. Not the, Not the international football. <laughs> <laughs> that would be a bit of a shock if the footballers turned up to talk about climate change. Um, okay, that's fine. I will, we will we'll look at that as well. That might be, um, I'll come back to you on, on where we can fit those in either as oral or as written yeah. by a citizen space. Um, given the large number of stakeholders and given the level of public interest in this, um, it's, it's just not going to be possible to take evidence from everybody who's an interest and everybody who will want to come to the committee. So I'm looking at actually, actually looking at two stakeholder events. So the first one, or sort of the two, two events, so the first one will be a stakeholder event. So for those organisations, NGOs, government departments that have a, a specific interest in the event. And the second one will be a very specific youth event because climate change has by and large been quite clearly been driven by young people um, and the profile has been raised um, considerably by young people. So both events, we're looking at them on the 17th of June, the stakeholder event in the morning um, uh, between 10 and 1 and the youth event in the afternoon, in the evening between 6.30 and 8. 
um, as the committee know themselves, when they met with the, with the youth and um, climate change uh, group, uh, young people tend to be at school and just don't tend to be available during the day. So the group, they, the, the, these um, stakeholder events more or less run along the same lines. Um, there will be a sort of an introduction and an overview taking about 20 minutes. We'll do, this will all be virtual. We'll do virtual breakout rooms. Um, the, the breakout people in the breakout rooms will be asked to consider um, specific questions or topics. Um, we would like one or two members to be in each breakout room and we'll have a member of staff in each breakout room taking notes. Those notes will then be fed back from every group at the end in a plenary session, which will probably take about, you know, if you have eight groups, you take, allow them 10 minutes each to feed back. Um, you know, that takes some time. But it's that feedback that's important, members, and that feedback will be created as, the, uh, you know, um, PowerPoint slides that will become the evidence for the committee. So that's, that'll take place, um, where we're suggesting that on the, the 17th of June, um, the youth one will be a similar type of event. Engagement or the assembly engagement um, directorate will be looking at running that specifically for us. Mm -hmm. Now, that's just a, an overview. We will obviously bring a detailed plan back to you. But if we are going to run and organise two stakeholder events on the 17th of June, we really need the permission now to start organising and planning because that's literally five weeks away, really. So um, if, you, if you wouldn't mind, we would need um, your, your approval now to start planning and organising, and we will bring the details of that back for your, your for formal approval. Okay. So also, as I said, at Appendix A and further on down, there's a list of organisations to give oral evidence. Um, and again, again, we need approval for that because we need to start working on that to get out invitations. That's actually a page, if you look at page 29, which is the provisional timetable, you'll see who we're bringing there. I'm not going to go through that in any detail, but there's a specific reason why we have looked at everybody. So we're looking at the environmental sector to talk about the climate change bill, but also to talk about the biodiversity clauses, about the environmental non-regression clauses, about the nitrogen budget and about the other aspects of the bill. We also have the UK Committee on, on Climate Change and AFPI, again, none of these people have been invited, so they may be hearing this for the first time. Um, and um, we would need to get them in very, very quickly. Um, and that might be where we have to take us in as well there. Um, we'd have the, um, a break there on the 16th of June, probably to focus on the work on the ports and try and get that cleared up. Stakeholder event, and then um, organisations that can talk to us about um, carbon capture and particularly engineered carbon capture methodologies and the agri-food sector in there as well. Agri-food sector need to have a very clear voice here. Um, government departments, because there's considerable work provisions in here for the government departments and they need to be uh, responding to um, you know, what that work means for them, how long they'll need to do that and if there's any associated costs. And then we'll take the, the experts there that are suggested um, because we're bringing in the UK Climate Change Committee, I've brought in two experts that have been used by the Oireachtas, and I'm going to suggest those there. Um, we can't bring in every sector that's mentioned because it just isn't time. So I've looked at local government and um, waste and the, and the power generation sectors, renewable sectors in there as well. But obviously there's loads of sectors you could bring in to talk to you about that. Um, those are the only ones that, have, uh, that I think we can manage to fit in. Um, and that would bring us up to just before Halloween recess, where we would then begin to, all, or sorry, we'd also beginning to start taking evidence on the horse racing bill while the committee goes away and starts to consider its written evidence, the citizen space, tries to identify <coughs> what its key issues are, look at areas where it might want amendments. You don't have to identify them right away, but you might want amendments. And then you will start, just before Halloween, set, Halloween recess, start your work on the clause by clause. You do that informally first. Um, don't underestimate how long that takes. You think, oh, we'll run through that in one meeting. That is very rare. I've, I have left what I think is enough room, but we could run out of room very quickly. 
and you could be into additional meetings very quickly there as well. Uh, looking at agreeing on an initial draft report in November, getting it signed off and um, into the business office before the committee stage would end on, if you, if you agree with the extension, on the 16th of December. So I know we've got um, evidence, uh, people coming in to give evidence at 12 o'clock and you need to do that. Um, but I just wanted to um, run through that. Sorry, the one thing I did want to mention was obviously there is there will bill will be of um, because of the cross cutting nature of the bill, it'll be of interest to various assembly committees, some of whom are already doing work on um, you know reducing carbon in, for example, transport, reducing carbon in the energy sector, infrastructure committee, the economy committee, for example. And I think that we should ask the the assembly committees. Um, what they think as well. However, the bill also extends considerable powers to the executive office, and the executive office, um, you know, uh, doesn't really have a role like this at the minute. So it's brand new. So as well as the, our committee looking at those powers and asking the executive office what it thinks, it is worthwhile asking the TEO committee to look at that aspect specifically and report back to this committee on that. So that's what I would propose to do. It, it doesn't um, prevent this committee looking at it as well, but um, that's how I would, um, what I would propose to the committee. So again, quick run through, five minutes left, if mm. you would like to ask any questions. Stella, just see briefly, um, could you maybe, if it's possible, just give a wee overview of the citizens space because obviously there's going to be people who aren't part of the stakeholder organisations who won't be attending the evidence sessions but this may be an opportunity for them to have yes. their voice shared which yeah. is crucially important. Yeah. So um, most, of this, most of the stakeholders that are in my appendix either will be well used to citizen space. It is used by every government department here and it's used by um, you know the UK government and you know um, um, basically local councils. Everybody who's doing any kind of consultation at the minute uses citizen space so but it is new to new to here so they we're proposing and again we will bring this back to the committee in fact we hope to have the first draft of it back to the committee next week which will mean long hours for us working to get it done but we are proposing to um bring back a thematic approach breaking the bill down into themes saying this clause you know saying what clauses relate to those themes and to develop some questions underneath those themes. Now, the, the, the committee will be ultimately asked to sign off on, on that specific approach, but what it means is we will be using the same approach to take oral evidence. And so that means that everybody, whether they're given written evidence or oral evidence, will be given the evidence in, in, along the same themes, answering the same sort of questions. There will be specific questions you want to ask specific organisations. Um, and um, it means then that you will be able to interrogate and uh, analyse the data in an easily, uh, easy manner and very, in a very quick manner and consistent. Citizen space also means that if we have individuals who want to write in to us, that they're given a structure to do so. So that you can have, if, if there are people out there, and there are a lot of public interest in, in, in this, who decide that they wish to write in individually to the committee, that they can do so. And that that information, again, is captured in a way that we can then present it to the members. So, for example, if you got, just given the resources we have, if you got 700 or 800 individuals writing into the committee, I would be presenting you with seven or 800 written responses because we would not, literally, have not the facilities the capacity or the resources to analyse those. Well, we would be able to do it, but we'd still be doing it a year later. So what we can do is if we can allow people to go through citizen space, it does a lot of the analysis work, which means then that you will get to hear the voice of the individuals. Um, we, of course, if people can't have access to computers or um, have any kind of difficulty themselves in answering the um, using citizen space we will provide a paper copy of the same themes and same and same questions so that people can fill it in by paper and get it into us and we'll, that means that we can actually um, add it manually 
so that they are then their information is going into the same space and being analysed in exactly the same way. Okay, Philip, you're looking quickly there before we move to the yeah, evidence section. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, just briefly, I want to thank uh, the clerk for that uh, very, very thorough uh, piece of information. Uh, she has answered an awful lot of the questions that I, that I certainly had. But I mean, given that this is undoubtedly the, the, the most important issue that this committee will will deal with, and, and maybe unquestionably the most important issue that the Assembly will deal with uh, in this mandate, it is important, as, as Stella has said, that, that not only organisations and stakeholders uh, get an opportunity to have their voice heard, but that citizens across the North uh, get an opportunity so that we hear all range of arguments and opinions on this vitally important uh, argument. So, I mean, I would suggest maybe that from a committee point of view, I mean, obviously the politicians and, 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 and Claire as the bill sponsor will do their own work publicising all of this, but from a committee point of view, I, I think that maybe we should have some kind of simplified, uh, whether it's video or publication on the website, just alerting people to this very specific issue and how they can participate in it and the process that we are going to go through uh, with regard to this bill. I think that would be very, very useful. Okay, sorry, Philip, I didn't mention it, but that's already been organised. We've already got Declan set up to do that next week. And oh. um, I have the makeup on hand. He'll have blue eyeshadow. And <laughs> so, yeah, no, we, we, we've, it, we've it all. We're, we're already working on that. That's, sorry, and I should have mentioned it, but that's almost a de facto thing that we do. So um, when okay. people come to the, to the page where they link into Citizen Space, there'll be a short video from Declan doing exactly what you say. Okay, apologies, I wasn't aware of that. <laughs> no, 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 you work. weren't aware of it. I should have mentioned it. I should have had it down here. You're quite correct. It should have been in the paper. Okay, members, we're going to move now to an evidence session of the Mid East Antrim Borough Council uh, just now. Uh, but I want to just say, members, we have a very strict finish time today at 1.30 pm. So please, can members keep their questions concise? in order so that everybody gets an equal opportunity so that we're not rushing towards the end. And if you could if you wouldn't mind, if you do ask a question or maybe two, you can come back in at the end if there's space for, for, for another question, but just to give everybody a chance okay. so that I'm not rushing at the end or nobody gets cut off. Okay? Mm -hmm. Um so uh, so, item 20 in the agenda then is uh, oral evidence uh, Mid, Mid East Antrim Borough Council withdrawal of DERA and local authority staff from the ports. I want to refer members to the, um, uh, um, to the letter from the Chief Executive and Donnelly to Minister Pooch, it's page 385, and the letter to the Cabinet Office at page 386. There's also correspondence in Mid East Antrim Borough Council which has been tabled. Members will recall. Uh, that the committee asked for Belfast City Council and Newry, Moran and Down District Council for clarification if they had received any correspondence from the Cabinet Office in light of Ms Dunhey's letter. Belfast City Council has now responded and that can be found at page 389. Okay. Uh, okay. Um, okay. I'd like to welcome by Starleaf now, um, Anne Dunhey, Chief Executive of the uh, New South Borough Council. Councillor Peter Johnson, the mayor, and Paul McMinn. And Paul uh, McMinn's not coming. Sorry, Paul McMinn's not not coming. Okay. And can I ask the council representatives uh, to brief the committee, and the members will ask some questions. Okay. Yes, certainly. Uh, thank you. Can I just check um, with the, can the committee hear us? Okay. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. We're, we're loud and clear. Great. Uh, well, firstly, thank you, uh, Chair, and thank you uh, to the members of the committee today. Um, I have to say, when we appeared in front of you exactly a fortnight ago today for a lengthy cross-examination, we certainly weren't expecting to be in this same position uh, two weeks later. However, in the interest of full openness and transparency, we have willingly returned today to give further evidence in relation to two additional points for clarification as requested by the committee. I would firstly like to pay tribute to the Chief Executive today and her team be alongside having to invest a significant amount of time into preparing the information requested by the committee at a significant cost to our ratepayers have continued to prioritise the needs of the citizens and businesses of Mid and East Antrim as they continue to experience the detrimental impact of COVID-19 and embark upon what will be a very challenging recovery journey. 
I would like to ask the committee members to cross-reference Council's verbal evidence today and the 71 pages of written evidence we submitted on Tuesday with our original written evidence which runs to some 57 pages and our previous nearly two-hour cross-examination. In total, we have produced 128 pages of thorough evidence to answer the committee's queries and have given nearly two hours of our time to answer questions, so I trust that today we'll complete uh, this evidence. As requested under the committee's very clear and specific terms of reference for this inquiry, our original 57-page document provided an extremely comprehensive breakdown of all relevant documentation and information that was considered by Council's elected members prior to the unanimous cross-party decision to temporarily withdraw staff from the Port of Larne pending the formal written threat assessment by the PSNI. I listened, as I'm sure with uh, members of this committee today, to bits of the evidence given this morning by the PSNI, and I personally want to acknowledge the apology and clarification they provided with regards to their communication with Mid and East Antrim Council officials. This certainly is a positive step towards building back relationship and collaboratively working towards a better society for all our citizens, and I feel that is to be commended. I just would like to make a small point of clarification on one uh, inaccuracy with regards to the timing of the formal threat assessment. It was requested uh, from the district commander on Monday and was not received until Thursday evening. As stressed on numerous occasions, Council's priority is and always will be the health, safety and well-being of its staff and ensuring it meets the employer's moral and legal obligations to staff safety as outlined in the Health and Safety at Work Order of Northern Ireland 1978 and the Human Rights Act of 1998, Article 2, which protects every individual's right to life. I will now ask our Chief Executive to provide the committee with a high-level overview of the written evidence we have provided to respond to the additional questions from the committee which have brought us here today. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Mayor. And as instructed by our Mayor, I will touch upon the two uh, additional questions that the committee have asked Council to respond to in writing by Tuesday the 4th of May. I will summarise the two points for the committee. Turning to the committee's first question then as to whether Council informed the PSNI of concerns raised by the major trade union to our Head of Human Resource on Monday the 1st of February. In our uh, first written submission, Chair, Council clearly uh, documented eight separate engagements with the PSNI between the first appearance of the sinister and threatening graffiti in Larn on the 21st of January and Council's uh, unanimous cross-party decision uh, to temporarily withdraw our staff from the Port of Larn on the 1st of February pending the formal written threat assessment by the PSNI. This included communications from Council to the PSNI on the weekend leading up to the 1st of February and on the morning of the 1st of February when all matters giving Council cause for concern in relation to our staff at the port were continuously reiterated to the PSNI District Commander. Uh, the email from the Trade Union was received by Council at 1.45pm on the Monday the 1st. The concerns expressed expressed by the trade union in relation to the sinister graffiti and other alleged methods had already been raised uh, to the PSNA by council um, and they had given assurance to council that it was under investigation. At around 2.30 p.m. Chair, a second telephone call with the PSNI district commander that day, council reiterated its concerns and relayed all information it had in relation to the ongoing situation. In addition, uh, the trade union's concerns were raised at the DERA meeting with the minister that afternoon and with the council elected members, both at the meeting of the group party leaders and at the full council meeting that evening. And the email was uh, among a wide range of information taken into consideration um, in informing council's unanimous cross-party decision to temporarily withdraw our staff uh, from the port. Uh, finally, um, the trade union's email provided Provided no different information to the incidents already re reported and recorded with the PSNI over the weekend by the council.
council. Um, there was nothing specific additional information in it, um, and so we were happy that all concerns were communicated. Uh, moving on, um, and I would now turn the committee to the second question in relation to my letter of the 30th of uh, Saturday, the 30th of January, to the Cabinet Office official, which expressed a number of concerns about the practical and operational implementation of the Northern Ireland Protocol. Uh, Chair, at the previous committee uh, on the 22nd of, of April 2021, committee members referred to a confidential letter written by myself to the Cabinet Office. Without the benefit of having this letter in front of the Mayor or myself, uh, we were of the belief that it was sent on the 3rd of February. I, on behalf of Council, wish to clarify that the letter was sent on the 30th of January. Without the benefit of having the letter in front of us and uh, uh, relying on our recollection, bearing in mind, sure that we had 57 pages of written evidence in, in our head at the time, it, uh, we both thought it was on the 3rd of February. Council can now confirm, as a matter of record, that the letter was sent in confidence to a senior official on the 30th of January um, to the Cabinet Office. Turning to the role of Chief Executive and Solis, the role of the Council Chief Executive runs in parallel with any position that they fulfil in Solis. Often um, the various roles are complementary and therefore cannot uh, run in parallel without crossover. In clarifying the use of Mid and East Antrim Borough Council head of paper, it is not uncommon for letters to be issued by chief executives in the context of their dual role as council chief executives, whilst referring to and drawing on their positions um, or position representing Solus. That's clearly demonstrated, Chair, in Appendix 4, with letters written on council head of paper that refer to Solus business. For example, a letter written to the mental health champion on behalf of local government health and wellbeing group, which I chair on behalf of Solus, and that was sent on Mid and East Antrim head of paper. I think it's important to inform the committee that Solus has no formalised procedures around the administration of letters or the issuing of letters as a Solus working group chair. And it has been my common practice for the 12 years that I have been in Solus to use council stationery and administration of uh, Solus business due to the dual role and the significant crossover and the fact that Solus does not have a dedicated administration of support. In relation to the latter on the 30th of January, which has been shared with the Solus Chair, I clarified in the first paragraph that the letter was being sent confidentially and uh, introduced it in my role as the Chief Executive of Mid and East Antrim, and then referred to my dual role as the Chair of the EU Task and Finish Working Group. As I was also highlighting Mid and East Antrim's position in relation to union connectivity, which Chair, I made clear in the letter, um, and it was even more than appropriate that it was used on council head of paper. I can advise that this letter had a unanimous cross-party agreement at full council meeting of Mid and East Antrim Borough Council, to whom I am accountable. By writing the letter in a dual role, it allowed me, as the chair of the EU Exit Task and Finish Working Group, to draw on my first-hand experience at Lauren Port as the Chief Executive of Mid and East Antrim Borough Council. This dual role was clearly evidenced and recognised by Solus in their press statement, which they provided to the media on the 23rd of April, in relation to the query around the submission of the letter to the Cabinet Office on the 30th of, of January. January 2021. In the press statement, Solis said, Anne Donaghy, Chief Executive of Mid and East Antrim Borough Council, is the Chair of the Solis Northern Ireland EU Task and Finish Working Group. I think that demonstrates the dual role and how the two cannot be separated. The statement then goes on further to say, in the capacity Anne engages with, with DERA and the Food Standard Agency, and I quote, other relevant partner organisations regarding the implementation of the Northern Ireland Protocol for a, from a local government perspective. Chair, and I wish to draw to the attention of the members of the committee that 
in, in inverted commas, one other relevant partner organisation regarding the implementation of the Northern Ireland Protocol from a local government perspective to be and to include the Cabinet Office. The Cabinet Office has the responsibility for the operational domestic readiness up to and after the 1st of January 2021, and all command papers and operational guidance uh, relating to the Northern Ireland Protocol come from the Cabinet Office. From the 1st of February 2020, responsibility for the transition period and UK-EU negotiations were led by the Cabinet Office under the direction of the Minister for the Cabinet, who is the Chancellor of the Duchy of Lancaster. The Cabinet Office is the department responsible for the transition and the operational readiness uh, and the implementation of the Northern Ireland Protocol, and therefore is clearly uh, um, as I refer back to the SOLAS uh, statement, another relevant partner organisation regarding the implementation of the Northern Ireland Protocol. So, in line with the terms of reference of the EU Task and Finish Working Group, it was my role as chair of the working group to influence, articulate, and contribute to the wider policy issues regarding the implementation of the Northern Ireland Protocol and all actions that I have taken align with that SOLAS terms of reference. At the SOLAS meeting on the 8th of January and subsequently a special meeting on the 15th of January requested by myself as chair, I clearly raised the, the, the challenges facing local government and the need to raise these more widely. This is referenced to uh, in, in the com computaneous uh, notes taken by the SOLAS Local Government Liaison Officer contained in Appendix 7. From these two meetings, both the SOLAS Local Government Liaison, Liaison Officer and I were confident <laughs> that we had the full support of SOLAS to continue to raise the concerns of local government with the lead government department with responsibility and oversight, i.e. the permanent secretaries and the cabinet office as a non-devolved department and both considered to be another relevant partner organisation. In the update report provided to uh, the SOLAS Northern Ireland Chair on the 26th of January and subsequently shared with the Chief Executive, I once again highlighted the role of the Cabinet Office and noted the engagement would continue in an attempt to resolve the issues, mentioning specifically the Chancellor of the Duchy of Lancaster, who is specifically the Minister for the Cabinet Office. Having received no feedback or no queries from either the Chair of SOLAS or any SOLAS member, I continued engagement as set out in the meetings of the 8th, the 15th and in the report of the 26th and took their silence as a contentment with this approach. A similar report of the 26th was shared with my elected members on the 26th and it was subsequently approved at our council meeting on the 1st of February. With a growing number of risks identified by the 11 councils as evidenced in the task, EU Task and Finish Working Group's heat map, which is attached in Appendix 6, it became very obvious that the practical and the operational issues needed urgently to be raised by the department with the responsibility for the transition period and implementation of the, pro the protocol, given that the grace period was coming very close to the end. Whilst I had previously written to the Chancellor of the Duchy of Lancaster in my role as um, Chief Executive, due to the restructuring in the Cabinet Office, I was unaware of the appropriate official to raise these concerns with privately. A key stakeholder with national influence, I contacted two Members of Parliament from Mid and East Antrim to seek advices as to who would be the most appropriate senior official to engage with on these serious issues. The two parliamentary members from Mid and East Antrim or would be well versed on the ongoing practical and operational issues in relation to the implementation uh, challenges that we are having in relation to the protocol at Lauren Port, as they have been copied into numerous correspondence sent as key stakeholders um, in relation to Council's continued raising of these concerns. The MPs subsequently pointed me to Sir Geoffrey Donald, an MP, and advised that it would, uh, he would be able to identify the most appropriate senior official to contact. 
I duly contacted Sir Geoffrey Donaldson and he advised uh, to advise him that the two constituency MPs thought that he might be able to advise of the most appropriate senior official to contact in relation to the implementation issues. He provided me with the name of Mr. Brown Threefall uh, as the Cabinet Office Director responsible for overseeing transition and the implementation of the Northern Ireland Protocol. I subsequently uh, referred the letter to the MPs as it provided me with the advices in order to uh, put the correspondence into context for Mr Trefall and to why it was being sent. Uh, it would be normal practice for the Mid East Centre Borough Council officials to engage regularly with our Members of Parliament on a wide range of issues that impact on the borough. And whilst, Chair, uh, in closing, I'm happy to provide details set out in the letter in the Cabinet Office uh, uh, sent to the official on the 30th, um, I, um, which really sets out and addresses the concerns of the implementation uh, challenges around the Northern Ireland Protocol. I feel it is both necessary and important to clarify to you, Chair, and to the Committee that the issues raised of implementation regarding the Protocol were of no consideration and were not part of the consideration in relation to Council's health and safety responsibility for our staff. Solus Northern Ireland played no role or part in Council's cross-party unanimous decision to withdraw our staff formally from the Port of Larn. They are two separate issues. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, uh, Chief Executive, for what I trust the committee will agree uh, was another extremely comprehensive and compelling report. And uh, I trust and hope that the detailed evidence uh, has been thoroughly read. In closing this uh, verbal update, I unfortunately would like to put on record that as Mayor of Mid and East Antrim, I have been exceptionally disappointed by the approach taken by this committee towards Mid and East Antrim Council and our Chief Executive. I have a number of specific concerns and I would like to cover three of the most pertinent. Firstly, I have to say I find the time frame set for the submission of our response and to appear in front of the committee to be unreasonable and unfair on the grounds of procedural fairness. Secondly, I am sure I need not remind committee members the focus of this inquiry should be on the decision-making role of DERA. I believe the focus has unfairly been put on Mid and East Adrian Borough Council and, in particular, our Chief Executive. Finally, it has been brought to my attention that members of this committee have made public and, in my view, highly pre prejudicial comments in the media and on social media about Ms Donaghy, including an inflammatory comment calling for her resignation. I think this is absolutely appalling, considering this inquiry is still ongoing and the Chief Executive's actions and integrity are without question. In relation to this point, I refer to the Northern Ireland Assembly's Code of Conduct and the Guide to the Rules relating to the conduct of members. Incidentally, and indeed helpfully, this code was approved by the Assembly just a matter of weeks ago on the 23rd of March this year and came into effect on the 12th of April 2021. I trust it will have been very fresh in the minds of committee members throughout this process and the inquiry. Section 3 of the code under the principles of conduct for members of uh, Legislative Assembly states that members must act with objectivity and I quote Members must act and take decisions impartially, fairly, and on merit, using the best evidence without discrimination or bias. I certainly would question how comments expressed by members of this committee could possibly be described as objective or impartial, or fair, or based on merit, or indeed without discrimination or bias. One such comment, for example, carried within a press release stated, she, referring to Ms Donaghy, needs to return to the committee to provide clarity. And if these reports are true, then this damning revelation would make her position untenable. The Chief Executive's role is as a public servant answerable to Council. This appears to have been a partisan decision based on the word of one political party. That is not the role of the Chief Executive and she can no longer command confidence in her position. That is shocking. Members, and another statement by a councillor which issued in conjunction with the committee member read, 
Ms. Donachie's actions over the last number of months have damaged her confidence in her judgment. It would, it would be appropriate, I believe, for the Chief Executive to consider her position and the need to restore confidence at a time of heightened tension. One might be forgiven for thinking that in addition to acting outside of the code of conduct, which they are bound, certain members of this committee are being driven by a very cold and calculated predetermined agenda. Indeed, I would hope the Commissioner for Standards for the Northern Ireland Assembly looks into this partisan conduct. I have to say that I completely understand then why a number of elected representatives, including some in this committee, have publicly described this whole debacle as a witch hunt. I think it is also perfectly understandable that our Chief Executive would feel very personally and very publicly attacked by members of this committee. It certainly is not fair. And I don't think we can underestimate the scale of the stress and upset caused to Ms Donaghy when we, the elected members and indeed the electorate of Mid and East Andrum, expect her full and undivided attention to be on Council's continued COVID-19 response and our efforts to promote the long-term recovery and growth of our borough for its citizens and businesses. In addition to this seemingly very personal vendetta against one individual, and I'll finish on this point, I go back to the point I made when we first appeared in front of this committee a fortnight ago. That was a matter exclusively focused on the safety of 12 young employees at Larnport, and indeed one which warranted unanimous support across all parties, and it has certainly been turned into a game of political football, which I find wholly unacceptable. I would welcome the views of members of uh, this committee in relation to this, and I will pass back to the Chair uh, to take us through that. Thank you. Um, okay, thank you uh, for that evidence. Um, I have a number of members who want to ask questions, but there's just a couple of uh, points I just want to raise first before we move around the room. Um, you made reference at your last uh, session that you're disappointed about not being involved in the gold command structure meetings. Um, we learned then just from the police there a while ago that this is an internal policing structure. Um, have, have any, has your council ever been involved in these before and why did you believe you should have been involved in it? Well, I, I thank you for the question, and I'll I'll, uh, I'll pass over to the chief executive just to give you um, some of the detail into that. Yeah, we, we have certainly been involved in gold command structures before. Um, in relation to uh, the members of that committee, I, I would need to come back, but I believe that there were DERA representatives on the committee and that there were representatives from the border control posts um, and, and from uh, EU on it. Um, and I, I believe that the council maybe had the only, the only partner that had staff at the port that was not uh, involved, um, but you would need to you would need to check that with the PSNI. Um, but I certainly feel that we should have been involved, and I think they have made a corrective action, which I very very much welcome, Chair. And that um, when the permanent secretary at the Dera committee um, uh, at the four forty five Dera committee on the first said. Oh, um, councils need to be involved, and, and uh, my colleagues and I were, were taken back that we, we hadn't been involved. Uh, we were immediately asked to that and have continued to be. I, I must say that it's a very useful uh, information. We're getting constant uh, updates on the track. So it's hugely important that we are as, as uh, involved in that in terms of keeping uh, an overview of, of the threat and any shifts or movements and that. So, um, and I, I think thank the, the, the Gold Command for including councils. Um, just, to, just to be clear there, just at the, the last briefing, the ACC referred to the Partners Group and the SPS Reference Group, but the Gold Command was actually an internal policing structure. Is there a chance that you have got those confused? I don't think so, and that if it was an internal police instruction, then I suppose my question will be back to you, Chair, is then why are we now invited to it and part of it? And, and actually, if I, if I can, Chair, you know, I, I appreciate the question you're asking, but I think, you know, what it reiterates is certainly when, when you look at the, the Chief Constable's approach uh, when he came in to police, and I know I made reference to this um, during the last session, that it was around community and community engagement and, and community policing. And, you know, the question back would be, why, why would you not want council to be involved 
at this level, and I think it is it is right and it and it is good. It is good for our our um, our community of Mid and East Antrim that we are involved, not least with such an important issue uh, as as the Port of Larne and, and the safety around that. Thank you. And just to, again on the MPs issue, um, I just note um, from your comments, Mr. Donahue, there that that you sussed out the two what you deemed as local MPs who then pointed you in the direction as of Geoffrey Donaldson. But I note then from the letter that you had referred to Geoffrey Donaldson as one of your local MPs. And I'm just curious as to know why does it happen to be that the three MPs in question are from the one uh, from the one political party, whereas you didn't go to the likes of Stephen Farry or Chris Hazard or Colm Eastwood or anybody like that there as a local MP? Because like Lagan Valley is... Uh, there surely is consistencies as local till your council is as legal lag and balling you, you didn't go near that didn't go to those MPs for advice well I, I, if, I, if I can chair and just for for point of clarity um I, I, I think it's fair to say that it's not the case that the chief executive deemed um Sammy Wilson and Ian Paisley to be local MPs they are Midney Standards local MPs um and and you know, I commend the chief executive. She's a very positive relationship with MPs, as any chief executive should have with their their local elected representatives for the area. And you know, I think uh, uh, in the evidence it has been well rehearsed now that the the, the process of, of, of action taken by the chief executive uh, in seeking communication with the cabinet office was, uh, as, as she mentioned, that she went through to those two MPs who, who advised her to contact. Um, uh, Jeffrey Dawson on that matter, and and look, let, let's let, let's um, not you know beat about around the bush. Jeffrey Johnson is a very experienced MP. He has a long uh, history uh, with with Westminster. He's a lot of relationships. I don't think it's it's unreasonable for any chief executive, in fact, any civil servant, to do whatever they can and contact whoever they need to. Uh, in, in order to, to get the right contacts um, and, and to ensure that their communications are going to the, to the right um, person. And you mentioned Stephen Farry. I certainly have no relationship with, with Stephen Farry, but you know, there's a relatively new MP into, into Westminster. I think to have this expectation that all of a sudden he has this rapid repertoire of contacts and relationship is, is um, I think, slightly unrealistic. Uh, and, um, Chair, Chair, I would like to build on that to say, you know, I've been a chief executive for over 12 years and I'm apolitical. I work with the Post and if if the MPs of Mid and East Antrim were of a different political party, I would still work with them. Uh, you know, I uh, over the 12 years I've worked with 12 now, soon to be 13 mayors, and those 13 mayors I've worked with them um, equally, fairly, and they've all come from a wide variety of parties. So it's always for me about the post and not about the party. So I just would like to put that on record. Yeah, yeah well, well, sorry, I just have been quoting from the letter that you wrote. I have been advised by my local MPs, Mr. Ian Paisley, Mr. Sammy Wilson, and Sir Geoffrey Donaldson. So the letter explicitly referred to Geoffrey Donaldson as your local MP. Uh, that's, I'm just pointing to the letter, right? The second uh, item I want to mention to was at the last briefing session, you had said that you felt that this letter wasn't pertinent to the inquiry. Now, uh, you know, the letter actually specifically references uh, the issues relating to Lauren Port, which is with this inquiry is looking into how, how do you feel that that how do you believe or justify that letter is not pertinent to this inquiry well i, I can certainly um answer that question too because you know and, and as we, we we answered in the last session the, the this committee and then the last inquiry was around the decision making process of us withdrawing staff from Lauren. So a letter that was sent confidentially from one official to another, which did not form part of the evidence that we considered on the day of the decision making, of course was not part of, of the of the evidence session. And, and actually, you know, if the chief executive was to was to start uh, including all her communications, of which she will have numerous amounts over that period of time, you know, you can start to see the day. Then this letter, and it's really important to stress this, Chair, the letter was not considered by any elected members during that decision-making process, and for that reason, it was then deemed um, non-relevance to the committee. Adding on to that, the, because the letter was um, brought to the committee, 
it then became politicised because, in some instances, actually, I, I believe some of the members were reading from the letter during the, the inquiry. And so the chief executive, um, under my instruction, took the right course of action and being very open with the letter, and we're happy to do that. We mentioned about being open and transparent at the start uh, of, of this session, and the letter has sim- uh, subsequently been uh, been ratified by, by full council uh, on Tuesday night. And, and again, I think what's really important for, for this inquiry and for, for anyone who, who may be listening, in any circumstance where we have taken a decision as a council around the issues of Lauren Port, we have received unanimous support from every party, not just the DUP, also Unionist Party, the SDLP, Alliance Party and Sinn Féin, unanimous report, uh, support. And those are recorded votes. The, the committee's welcome to, to, to check that. And, and I think that's important because we, we have now looked at that letter retrospectively, and the contents of that letter um, are, are reflecting the concerns that us as elected members in Mid and East Antrim are having for our local businesses and our local uh, local people on the ground. And so, you know, it did get the, the full support, and rightly so, because these issues that are mentioned in the letter, these aren't just issues for unionists. It's not just issues for Mid and East Antrim. It's issues for all of Northern Ireland. We're witnessing that day in and day out. And I know in this committee, we have a lot of seasoned, experienced um, uh, MLAs who I'm sure are, are inundated with concerns from businesses as I have been uh, over, over the past couple of months. So it's really serious. You know, we're at the business end at the minute um, of, of this protocol. And, and, and certainly um, as, as mayor and, and as, as the mayor of this council, we will be tasking the chief executive to continue writing those letters to Whitehall and to continue writing to the Cabinet Office expressing the, the feelings and the concerns that we have in Midden East Andrew. So, so just to be clear then before we move around the room, um, you got you got you got retrospective approval for the letter. So at the time of writing, under whose authority or direction was this letter written? Well, I think, as mentioned before, the, the letter was a, was a confidential letter that was uh, written by Anne to, and it was official to official. This wasn't a letter that we were publicising that was that was trying to make some grandstanding political point. It was a letter that was sent in confidence. Um, and I think that's really important to, to consider because um, had it been the other way around, had this letter been sent um, by the chief executive and publicised as some sort of grandstanding exercise, then absolutely this inquiry would be right to think, well, maybe there was a political element, but the fact it was the complete opposite the letter was sent in confidence and was marked confidential, expressing the concerns. And, and let's be clear, Anne is a very proactive chief executive, and she's at the cold face um, of, of, the, of the issues and the concerns um, of the people in Mid and East Antrim. And that does not stop when it comes to the port um, of Larne, which we all know is, uh, is, is certainly uh, highlighted in recent days with around uh, around the protocol so uh, and can i just add chair that i already have the approval of of council prior to writing the letter to um to communicate and to continue liaison with the government departments in relation to any implement, implementation issues around the protocol. You know, for many, many months, mm-hmm. uh, Mid and East Antrim has, on a monthly basis, had a paper on the protocol, on the implications. You know, we are sitting as a council that could potentially end up with a 10% increase in our rates if we don't get the funding sorted. 4.8 million. So I think it would be a dereliction of my duty not to keep um, highlighting the governance issues, the finance, the fact that there may be charging at the ports. We don't know how that's going to happen, who it's going to happen by, how much it's going to be. There's no IT systems. So, you know, I, I don't think that we can stick our heads in the sand and ignore these. And I can I can truthfully and honestly say that the implementation issues and the concerns are a completely different issue to the health and safety issues of our staff. We would have taken the same issue and the same actions if the health and safety issue would have been with our refuge collectors or our planners. It was it was 
because it was the port, but it does not mean to say the all the implementation issues highlighted in that letter. The sad thing and the very, very important thing that this committee needs to hear is that none of them have still been resolved. And certainly as a chief executive, that gives me sleepless nights. And so much so has it given our council sleepless nights that on Tuesday night, at a unanimous vote again, with the DUP, the TUB, SDLP, Sinn Féin, Alliance Party and the SDLP all voted, full vote 39 out of 39 members voted that we would take legal proceedings in terms of resolving these implications for Mid and East Antrim because we feel so strongly that the risk to our businesses and our risk we appear so high. This has absolutely nothing to do with withdraw withdrawn staff uh, from the port in relation to safety. It is a separate issue, Chair. And I think, you know, I, I, I towards know. that, if I can, Chair, we, we don't take these decisions lightly. These, these are, are, are of, of, of huge consideration for our constituents in, 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 in Mid and East Antrim and for some of the constituents of the members of this committee. I mean, we can't, we, we can't stress this enough. 10% rise on the rates. I mean, we're staring down the barrel of one of the most difficult economic um, situations we have faced in decades. You know, businesses are on their knees. Uh, we, we don't know the future for, for, for jobs um, in, in, in Northern Ireland. And I'm, I'm hearing of just recently of, of businesses closing and, and moving out. You know, we, we are looking at really uncertain and challenging times. And the Chief Executive's quite right. A complete dereliction of her duties if she were not to be screaming from the hilltops about a 10% rise on the rates just to fund um, the, the, the EHOs that we are required at the port. This is it's really serious stuff and, and actually, you know, as, as I'm coming through, I, I think the more and more um, I'm, I'm, I'm sitting through this and hearing it, you know, I'm actually quite glad that we're, we're, we're at this committee today and that we can present our concerns to the committee because ultimately, you know, you have a stake in this game too. And, um, and, and, and the, the idea of slapping £4.8 million uh, pounds of a bill onto our, onto our rates pairs at the minute, for me personally, uh, and, and I, I, I can certainly speak for my colleagues, um, uh, it is, it's just un, uh, untenable. It's, it, we, there's no appetite for it. And as much as I know there, there, there are some political parties who are calling for the rigorous implementation of the protocol. Uh, can I, can, I go back, can, can like. we get back to the, the I want to get back to the inquiry here and have six people looking to ask questions. Yeah. Is that okay? Certainly, yeah. Okay, thank you. Okay, uh, John, John Blair. John? Chair. Thank you. Uh, I don't think I can start without commenting that I, I don't think any of the comments made by the Mayor in his introduction there about uh, public commentary could be attributed to me. I have made no public comment about anybody's position or personality and in fact I can show where I sought advice on what members should be saying um, publicly or indeed even in the chamber through questions and I have a paper trail for that. And and that's that's admirable that, because I think that is the right way for, you know, for the committee to be Sure. Not, not because you, you didn't say every member, but uh, it might be worth it if, if anybody's going to be accused of that, that they be named because it casts an aspersion over the rest of us. Um, yeah. and, and I hope you understand my clarification there. Um, yeah. you, you referenced at the start, and I totally appreciate it, um, both the resource dedicated to this by the Council, and I, I need to tell you there's been a considerable resource dedicated to the, the uh, issue by this committee and members of this committee. Yeah. Uh, we have to deal with a number of bodies, of course, in relation to this inquiry. Um, you mentioned openness and transparency as well, and I'm with you on that, and I'm sure you would agree that accuracy is a vital component of openness and transparency. And in that regard, can I, on the subject of accuracy, draw your attention to items number 56 and number 57 in the report you've submitted, where you reference, it can only be, it can only be um, uh, attributed to me, uh, questions asked in relation to the letter to the cabinet office and you say on that report at point 57 the date of the letter referred to by the committee member was not clarified by him that conflicts considerably with the hansard report from that committee which shows clearly that in my opening question before anybody spoke from the point book in my opening question i said will you confirm you wrote to the cabinet office on the 30th of january 2021 
So the date was stated very clearly by me. And the Hansard report also shows that I went on to reference that date on three further separate occasions. Can I request in the interest of accuracy that that record be amended? Show that. Yes, and, and that the yes. committee also notes um, that the uh, points 56 and points 57 in the report with respect are not accurate. Well, uh, publicly available, by the way. Yes, and, and, and uh, thanks for, for your question. And um, just before we, we pass the chief executive, I, you know, I, I just want to um, you know reiterate the point that you've you've made, John, because um, at, at the start you're, you're quite right. You know, this this is is, is an inquiry, um, and it's and it's quite with you know. I'm certainly on the same side of the fence. If you hear, you know, we are both elected members, and one of our primary roles and responsibility is scrutiny, and that's our job to do that. And, and, and certainly, you know, we, we, we as elected members, actually, we should take pride in that. Um, what, what, what I would say, just in terms of the uh, of the resource put in, and, and you know, you mentioned too that um, a lot of resource has, has been put in from your side, and and we, we, we're kind of on the same page as this, John, because you know, your your committee will you, you you're dealing with a climate crisis at the minute. You know all of the, the the issues that are that are coming through with regards to uh, the environment, um, not least to say Brexit, um, and in the middle of this, um, but with complete respect to the committee, we're we're spending hours and, and significant hours. I mean, you, you can see that the the, the the amount that has been that has been submitted, significant hours on preparing a detailed step by step of what happened and who said what, and you know. To give you an example, I mean, just this week, John, you know, I, I have been out trying my best to help businesses as they get their shutters open, um, coming out of what has been one of the most difficult times. Mm -hmm. And again, with, with, with complete respect to this committee, rather than me being on the ground, helping those businesses, getting the economy going again at Mid and East Antrim, and getting, you know, a bit of revitalization back again, we've had to commit, you know, significant time sitting in an office looking back over over what was said so that for me you know is, is the challenging bit um and you know certainly i'm, I'm happy to pass over to the chief if, yeah. if there's anything you want to add on that and, and john um, good to see you again I, I didn't think i would see you so soon again but good to see you um and i i checked that out john and if that is inaccurate i absolutely will will change up but I, I just i'll have to check that out but thank you for drawing that to my attention thank you uh, I've checked the Hansard report and I mentioned the date four times. Um, if I can move on to the questions then, um, it seemed to me to, to, to correct the situation that the first time elected members were briefed properly or officially in relation to what were threats or perceived threats was at the group leaders meeting on the Monday the 1st of, of February. Can I ask for clarification, I know some of this is referenced in your report today. Um, did you, at that meeting with group leaders, prior to the decision being taken to withdraw staff, reference the letter to the uh, Cabinet Office um, or intended correspondence with the, dear, or previous correspondence with the dear Minister? I can answer that um, quite uh, quickly for you, John, and the answer was no. There was absolutely no reference to that letter. At the group leaders meeting? Ever uh, the, the first the letter was 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 made public was on social media after the the inquiry um, a couple of weeks ago and was subsequently ratified on Tuesday by Phil Council. Okay, can I ask then in relation to communication? By communication, I mean um, verbally or in writing, formally or informally. Um, given that a letter of some importance could be argued was well, sent to the cabinet office and, and uh, a very important email to a government minister as well. Um, and I'm not clear as to whether it was, all of those things were shared with uh, members. And I could ask if they weren't shared with members, um, on whose behalf were they written then? Um, it seemed a pretty obvious question, but, but to clarify something uh, in terms of the, the evidence given today, were, were those items of correspondence either to the, the Cabinet Office or to the dear Minister uh, communicated with you as mayor of the borough so that at least someone other than the chief executive was aware of the correspondence that was being sent were you either briefed on that or copied into that at any stage no, and just um one point i want to come back to you on that john um just before i answer the question 
Um, the, the letter was sent from official to official, and I think that's the important part in this, because um, as a chief executive, one of the things that I certainly take pride in, and I hope um, Anne can take pride in, is that she has her finger on the pulse. She knows the mood of, uh, of the council. And, you know, probably if, if I was Anne sitting here today, um, or maybe even actually on Tuesday night, would probably see it feel slightly vindicated by her letter because it got cross-party unanimous support um, following. And I think what is um, admirable about her approach to this is that when we were presented with the information, um, and this is an answer to your question, when we were first presented with the information on the day, we were given facts and we weren't presented with this letter, we weren't briefed on this letter, we weren't told about the letter, um, because you're right, it's strong, and it's certainly my opinion, you know, when I read that letter, that's reflecting the, the conversations I'm having with businesses. Um, but it's really important to stress that when we took that decision, it was not a political decision, um, and it had absolutely, the letter had absolutely no bearing on that decision. If I could just, John, if I could just add, you know, I, I said earlier, you know, the, the council here have made it clear, you know, we're at the cold face, one of only three border control posts in Northern Ireland. Now, the difference in ours is we never had a border control post. So you can only imagine what it's been like trying to get that all sorted out. And what I'll say is we, you know, we have been writing like, all of these issues that was that was written in terms of the, the points for discussion with one official to another had been raised by other councils. It's on a heat map that's in your appendix from the eleven councils on on the group that I chair. But also, I have written uh, as instructed to the Duchy of Lancaster to the Secretary of State with all of the same issues from this council. So there was nothing new in that. It just was about trying to get a resolution to the issues that, that, that were there. So, you know, that is, a, there, there's a clear line of, of, of letters previous that were very, very similar to that letter, John. Yeah. But you're saying that you were written as instructed. It's clear to me that you could not possibly be instructed if the council was unaware of the letter, either at the group leaders meeting or the full council, and it didn't it didn't ratify the letter until approximately three months after the letter was sent. So I'm going to ask again, just for absolute clarification, um, was even the mayor in his position briefed on or copied into letters to or emails to the cabinet office or the dear minister over the weekend from the 30th of January to Monday the 1st of February? No, uh, John, and, and actually I'm quite glad I wasn't because um, uh, on, on two points, one, the, the committee would quite rightly be able to ask me the question and say, listen, Mayor, you sat in on that, uh, on, on that meeting that day, you were in receipt of that email, you were certainly biased in, in your decision-making process. The committee would be quite, quite within their, their rights to ask me that question. And, and two, um, I think in, in hindsight, and hindsight's always a wonderful thing, the, the fact now that we have had cross-party support um, for that letter, and that's cross-party support from the Alliance Party, the DUP, UUP, TUV, Sinn Féin, SDLP, and even our independents, all voting in unanimous um, favour of the report which can contain this letter. I think, um, as I mentioned, hindsight, wonderful thing, is now kind of uh, saying down anyway, and I think it, it would be loud and clear, if it had been the other way around and had Anne been here today um, and that letter was rejected by the council, it would be a, certainly a different um, uh, can, committee session. Uh, so. And John, if I could bring you back, um, you know, I have permission to, before I wrote the letter, I had a generic permission to continue to correspond with the government departments that in, in relation to the implementation of the protocol and our ongoing concerns. And the, the lead government department, it, it's, a no, it's, a, it's a reserved matter. It is not a devolved matter, and therefore the lead government department is the cabinet of the cabinet office, and the minister for the cabinet office is the Duchy of Lancaster. So I already had that permission, and my council were well versed on that. And okay, I'm grateful. Look, I'm aware of time here as well, so I'll ask a final question that relates directly to the task before this committee and, and the inquiry mm -hmm. in relation to a series of events. Some might say coincidences up to and on the evening of the 1st of February, when in and around the same time, a council was deciding 
to withdraw staff. A government minister was deciding to withdraw staff. And in addition to that, my recollection of media reporting is that the first minister was about to go into uh, a meeting or discussion with the Duchy of Lancaster. Now, all of those events came together on the evening of the 1st of February. Prior to that, the chief executive wrote that letter to the cabinet office in which she said, and I quote, I am aware of the involvement of paramilitary groups. Can I ask you, then, Chief Executive, whether or not the information was shared with the Mayor? Um, what was your evidence in relation to that paramilitary involvement? And how did you become aware of that paramilitary involvement to an extent that you were able to put it in writing to the uh, Cabinet Office, even though the PSNI have said, and said clearly and repeated today, that as far as they, as far as they were concerned, any evidence presented was uncorroborated and unsubstantiated. John, if I can, and, and, and I, I, I say this with the utmost respect um, for yourself and the, and the committee, um, I uh, feel there's a very fine line that, that we, we can tread here and that uh, one, uh, today we're here on the, to, to give evidence on the three subjects mentioned, A, B, and B, part one and two. Um, and I, I realise that there's, there's the temptation to go back and ask more questions with regards to the the evidence given at our first session, but you know I think for the, for on a few fronts, you know for for the uh, the interests uh, of time. I mean, I'm happy if the chief wants to answer that question. And I know on the day, you know, we were given lots of information from grassroots, and, and I certainly wouldn't expect any civil servant to be exposing, you know. Uh, resources. It's it's the job for us as elected members to corroborate all that data and information and, and, and take a, a decision. Um, but you know, I, I today personally want to make sure that we try and focus firstly on, on the issue with regards to uh, point A, which is uh, whether or not we had contact with the police with regards to the letter of the union. Point B, uh, point B part one, uh, with regards to the site of the letter of the cabinet office. And, and Anne's role as a solace representative in part two, um, providing our views on the content um, of that letter. So I'm just, I just want to be um, clear on that. Um, uh, uh, John, I, I am happy to, to, to go back and give you maybe a little bit more clarity. I, I think that the previous evidence two weeks ago um, made it clear that I had reported it through to the PSNI and, and I was made aware of grassroots, political grassroots. Now, I've been a chief executive for over 12 years. Um, I, I, my elected members are very well connected to the community and, the, and I know a lot of community representatives out there. And nine times out of ten, um, there is something behind what they say. Nine times, um, you know, so I take what I hear from them as uh, until proven otherwise. And, you know, and I did ask for the formal written threat assessment on, on, um, from the, the super uh, on um, the Monday. Um, I have been talking to them over the weekend. I was not made clear that that was not the case. So for me, I was only reflecting at the time of writing what the position was. And, you know, I'm actually delighted. You can't uh, begin to know how pleased I am for my staff that the, the threat assessments continues to be low. But I will say, if it changes, we will be back in the room. Our risk assessment every week, we, we're assessing it because, do you know what? There are 12 young people, and I always think, in my in my role, like I'm a mother, and I think if it was one of my own children going down there, they're all, all young. You know, so you have to be responsible. You have to take your duty under the Health and Safety at Work Act mm -hmm. uh, so seriously. And nothing, nothing will ever come before that for me. Um, so all I was trying to do was give a reflection of a point in time what the issues were. And sadly, sadly, all of those implementation issues have not been addressed. And I think as well, you know, just to, to finish on that point, um, uh, John, you know, we, we heard today from um, the PSNI and, and that they now are acknowledging the, the rising tensions in, in the community. And I, I just want to go back to, to the last um, evidence session and what I said, because it still remains true today. We have to take a safe and not sorry approach every time. And, you know, it's, it's, um, we appreciate now that the PSNI are, are acknowledging those rising tensions, but the source of those tensions and, you know, the detail of those tensions 
we start to waste time delving into that, you're taking risks and, and, and that's taking a risk with our staff. And we, we had to, on the day, make a, a, a very a, a very strong decision, which I felt was, uh, was well informed. But importantly, and this is getting back to the case of the letter, very importantly, was certainly not prejudiced by the letter sent to the Cabinet Office. Okay, um, okay thank you. Uh, thank you. John. Right, folks, uh, we'll need to move on here. Patsy? Patsy? We're <clears throat> running up now. Yeah, yeah Patsy, okay. got you. Thanks very much indeed. And, um, it's good to see us back again. Um, two or three things just want to draw to your attention. Um, just in relation to this letter that there's been considerable focus on media ways and, and the likes and as to whether it was relevant or pertinent or not. I think mm -hmm. pertinence of it and the background to the withdrawal of staff and uh, I listened very carefully there, Mr. Mayor, uh, the, the paramount and upper importance, upper most importance is the safety of staff. Yeah. But for a letter uh, does refer to, I am aware of the involvement of paramilitary groups, um, you would appreciate it becomes very salient and very relevant to those of us who collectively all have uh, the concerns of staff and the concerns of anyone who might be potentially at risk by paramilitaries. That should be at our very core of our being. So uh, what I wanted to establish just was, and uh, I've heard different dates mentioned in relation to to this particular letter and i'll come back just to the the authority of the letter um but the dates now why why is, or who suggested or who brought it before the council to receive retrospective approval of this letter oh, I, i'll take that one um patsy and yeah good to see you again as well um on, on your on your first question um and, and, and I feel we're, we're, we're maybe going over some of the things that we've already um, went through in the past inquiry, but I think it's important um, that, we, that we can, and, and I'm happy to reiterate those points today. Um, Anne, and, and, and I hope uh, the committee can appreciate that within her role as Chief Executive, it is her role to bring to us information, and, and as elected members, we take the decision based on the information. Now, we have the benefit of having uh, a chief executive who has been in this role as a chief executive for 12 years, very experienced, um, and, and, and she knows what, what, what she's doing here. So um, I want to make two quick points on that. The first one is, if uh, Anne, and, and I'm, I'm, I'm putting a, a, a situation to you here, um, Patsy, if Anne was made aware by an elected member, by grassroots, whoever, whatever, of a threat, be it paramilitary, non-paramilitary, a risk, rising tensions, and she didn't bring it to council, I would then be asking the questions, and, and again, this is re, 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 uh, going back to the, the point that, that the council needs to hold and to account on that matter. I would be asking the question, I'd be saying, listen, Chief Executive, you were made aware of this threat. And let's be clear, it's, it, Anne is not in the PSNI. It's not for her to investigate that threat, to corroborate it. She, it's, it's her role to bring that forward to us and for us to make the decision. So um, I, I think, and, and I, I realise I'm going into the details of council business here, but I think it's important for the inquiry to, to consider that. And um, we, you know, it, it's maybe tempting to, to, to dwell on this word paramilitary. Um, I think the, 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 the fact of the matter is, I was given information. We had all uh, received information. Part of that was that there was the understanding that there was paramilitary involvement. We considered that. We did. We took the safe, not sorry approach, and then we waited for the PSNI threat assessment four days later to say that there was no level of threat. Now we welcome today the fact that the PSNI are are uh, are mentioning the fact that the and distinguishing the fact between risk and threat. And that's the real fine balance that we have to tread uh, as a council, particularly when it comes to to the safety of our staff. So, um, happy to, to clarify and reiterate. You know, should we be in the same situation again? I personally, as an elected member, would be expecting them to bring that information to us, with regardless of of its source or um, or, or or whether or not a committee or whoever, in hindsight, did, decided to, to deem its credibility. And I, and I just I think that's important, and I just wanted to make that point. 
Okay. So, a question. Who decided that the letter needed to be brought before the council for a retrospective approval? Well, there was an item on the agenda and, and it was in, in closed council. So um, I'm, I'm not going to go into the, the details of, of what happens in closed council because that is uh, uh, that, that's a matter for council. And uh, the items that go onto the agenda are, are also a matter for council. And um, I'm sure, Patsy, you'll be aware, you know, when, when a full council meeting has come up, there's quite a rigorous process between myself as the mayor and the chief executive um, of, of the agenda, what goes onto the agenda um, and, and what's to be considered. And that's, that's, a, that's a matter for council. So the answer is that you, the mayor and the chief executive decided to bring it on the agenda for retrospective approval. Well, ultimately, I, I'm the mayor, and and, and yes, I, I I I chair the the, the full council meeting, and, and if you like, I, I set the agenda. And right. I mean, I'm, I'm not sure where where you're maybe, where you're going with 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 the question, but the, the fact that the letter was on the agenda has now um, uh, sought the full unanimous cross party support um, is, is is quite significant in my opinion. It was retrospectively approved after having been put on the agenda for approval by yourself. That's what you're telling me. Yeah, I, look, I, I, I think it's quite clear. You know, can, can I can I clarify, Patsy? Can I can I can I clarify, Patsy? That um, I, I think I've said this maybe a few times, but just to clarify, that council had given me as chief executive permission um, a quite a, quite a considerable months ago to uh, to continue liaison with government. In, uh, in relation to any issues in, uh, um, on the implementation, the concerns, the challenges with the, the protocol. So, you know, I was I was very clearly able to do that in relation to that approval. So, um, and, and that was the case. And I, I will also say that we have been for many, many months um, writing letters uh, to the, the Cabinet Office, to the Minister of the Cabinet Office, to the Secretary of State, to the Prime Minister, to DERA, to FSA, to FSANI, trying, trying, trying to get the implementation issues covered because I, I'll give you an example of, of the pressure that I'm facing. I have 12 AHOs at the minute at the port. FSA, and I'm like I'm like the chief veterinary officer. I'm in the same position as Robert is because he is feeling the pressure of where does he get the staff. I can tell you it is not a job that everybody wants is the first thing. Secondly, I've been told by FSA using their volumetric that I need a further 56 environmental health officers and I also need four supervisors. Where am I going to get 56 environmental health officers fully trained um, to actually carry out the full inspection regime? We are not carrying that out at the minute because we're in the grace period. I'm very aware that the grace period is finishing in October. If I can bring my worry back to you, Patsy, it finishes in October. There's a three month tra training regime that has to be gone through by these EHOs in terms of the checks and from the EU side, etc. And that's carried out by DERA and the FSA. So if I have to get someone in post, I need a six week period to advertise to get them. And then I need a three month period to train them. The first of March or the first of October is going to be there. My second problem is no one has been able to tell me, not anyone, what am I what am I expected to deliver at the port come the first? Is it going to be from here to the hundred percent, or is it going to be an uh, integrated phase? Where's the money coming from? And if you were sitting in my position as chief executive, you would be flagging it up to anybody that you could, especially the cabinet office who actually has the responsibility. Yes, I probably would have just on that matter. Um, so um, I just want, you felt you had the authority to write the letter, yet there was a requirement, this is my observation, yet there was a requirement to seek retrospective approval for it. Now, that's as far as I want to go with that. Um, the second thing is, and I just want to discern the, the role and the difference here, because clearly, as, as a member of uh, the chair of this committee on solace, um, you're clearly representing solace views and solace opinions and solace have said they weren't consulted about this letter. Now, um, the reason why uh, I would have thought it would have been relevant and pertinent or salient 
for you to have confronted on this matter is that we heard from two other chief executives, both in Belfast and Uri and Morn, who were similar, albeit not quite as intense positions as yourself, but potentially facing similar sort of circumstances. And um, is there any particular reason why you didn't consult with them to establish if in fact you were acting in that role as the chair of the Solace Committee to establish what issues they may or may not be facing as to what the, the relevant points would be at their ports or the ports within their, how would we call it, their local government jurisdiction? I think, you know, Patsy, that is a good question and, and it almost nearly makes the point because if, if when, you, when looking through the evidence um, with regards to the, to the issue around Solis, and, and I'm happy for Anne to provide a bit more detail, but certainly in the reading, you know, this, this is a group of, uh, of chief executives who are working together uh, and, and who give each other um, uh, roles and autonomy and responsibility to pursue uh, different, and, and you, you've seen, you know, the different working groups that they have, um, uh, and to quote in some of the, the the evidence, you know, there's a there's there was a, a desire, you know, that do whatever you have to do, get the job done, um, and I realise, you know, we, we, we are we're wanting to to, to try and. and uh, potentially politicise th this letter when it was never uh, it was never intended to be po po uh, politicised. But if Solis or if, if other chief executives choose to distance themselves from the, the comments uh, or the tone or the message in that letter, that's for them. But from my perspective, you know that that letter is reflective of the concerns I'm hearing on the ground. Um, it is certainly reflective of. Uh, of, of, of what we have seen in hindsight, and I talked about the benefit of hindsight, and um, it's certainly given the concern that we have as elected members that we are staring down the barrel of a 10% rise in our rates if we don't get these issues sorted at Lauren Port. So, yes, I can, regard, I can regard that if you're writing in, in the context of mid east Antrim Borough Council. Uh, yes, I, but so this, I, uh, we, we've, heard, we've heard about parallels and crossovers uh, and between yeah. Midney and Solace, uh, Solace, two Solace representatives have told us they weren't consulted about something ostensibly written on their behalf, and it would have been pertinent or relevant, to use your own words, Anne, back at you, two issues that would be following on and happening in there, and potentially up in Derry too. So I'm uh, trying to establish why a very significant letter was written to the Cabinet Office reflecting the views of Mid and East Anthem Borough Council, ostensibly written in a capacity as well as and the rest of the other councils with facing potentially into similar issues as you may be experiencing in that area weren't consulted even about that base of that letter. So, um, Patsy, very happy to answer your question. And I'll just begin by saying I'm one of the longest serving Solace members, so I understand how it works. And I have chaired numerous groups over the years, um, too many to even, even mention. But what I will say is Solace has um, no administrative support. Um, and um, I have always, uh, following, of course, the support of my council and approval, I've always carried out my own administration and the services of those groups as has every other chief executive. You'll see in my appendix four that I have provided examples for the committee to demonstrate the custom and practice of writing to external bodies and partners as a chief executive um, of Mid and East Antrim while also a chair of a Solus group. So, and you'll see that so that demonstrates the dual role, and you can you, uh, you can re read those at your leisure. And I suppose this is a custom and practice for other chief executives also, and you'll see that in, in the appendix as well. But it clearly demonstrates the crossover and the overlap between the role of council chief executive and the additional roles that they take on voluntarily as chairs of, of the Solus group. Solus has no standing orders or operating proceedings for writing letters, issuing or approved in our approval mechanism for letters for the chairs of working groups. There is no parameters and it's left to individual interpretation and professional judgment. Um, the ch as chair of the EU uh, task and finish working group, I had a very heavy workload in a very short time, as you know, um, with the announcements made. And that was demonstrated in five meetings of that group from the 14th of December to the 20th of January. And I was dealing with what was a very 
very complex and evolving and concerning issue. And uh, I carried out my duties uh, in that year in line with the terms of direction uh, or the terms of reference and uh, under the direction where the chair had said to me to get on with it. I clearly communicated with Solus on the 8th of uh, the month of January, on the 15th, where I called the meeting myself, and in the report that I, that I provided in my evidence on the 26th about the ongoing process. Having written the letter to Mr. Trefall on the to the Cabinet Office on the 30th, I uh, introduced myself as, and if you read the letter with me, the Chief Executive of Mid and East Antrim, responsible for the implementation of the protocol at Lauren Port. I then advised Patsy him that it was written in confidence. I also then identified myself as the EU Task and Finish Working uh, Group Chair. The letter carried a range of operational issues, practical examples from Lauren Port, and the operational issues and protocols uh, did not form any part of the decision-making process, as we've said, around the withdrawal of our staff from law and port on, in terms of health and safety. That letter was about implementation. I can confirm that I've already had, um, at, at, at the time of writing to Mr. Uh, Faithful, I had the time to, uh, the council permission to write it in terms that they had given me permission to write to government in relation to challenges on implementation on the Northern Ireland Protocol. Since my last appearance at the committee and in light of the misrepresentation and the politicisation of the latter, I took the confidential letter to, with the permission of the mayor, to the Middle East Antrim Borough mm -hmm. Council where it was endorsed on the cross party a unanimous basis and we've already told you that. In addition, Mid and East Antrim Council have further instructed me to continue to, to uh, communicate with the Cabinet Office officials because they are the body in charge of the implementation and the oversight of, of the, the protocol. It is disappointing uh, to me as a, a long-standing Chief Executive that Solis has um, not included all of the evidence that was available and um, given to the them uh, on the matter, and um, and and I would, um, I suppose, I'm very disappointed that they would not agree to allow me uh, to my request to bring as my aid the local government liaison officer who worked by my side. That being said, Patsy, I think some three months on, and with none of the implementation issues that uh, was outlined, I have to note by the eleven councils. You will see that in the risk assessment and um, the local government liaison officer updated that document uh, on, on numerous times, contacted all councils. So those risks were from right across local government. They were shared with Solus. And so I suppose um, what gives me greater concern uh, and it uh, causes me the sleepless nights is that the implementation issues are not. And I'm sure my other colleague chief executives have the same concerns, especially the ones at the ports. Um, but Lauren Port is slightly different in that we do not have or we did not have a border control post. Belfast had a border control post, I think, from 2000. So they're somewhat different. So every every council area has a different, as you know, Patsy, uh, from the Cookstown council area. You know, every, everywhere is different. That's what we're like in Northern Ireland. But um, indeed, what I would finish up by saying is that the elected members have agreed these are serious issues and I think that the focus now needs to look on how do we collectively as Northern Ireland get those implementation issues solved and if you know if the committee can in any way help but I can confirm that Solus Northern Ireland had no input into Mid and East Antrim's decision to withdraw the staff. And if we come back to the, to what this inquiry is about, is is the withdrawal of the staff from from uh, from Larnport. Solus had absolutely nothing to do with that in any way. And I, I, I wish to confirm once again there are two separate issues. One is about the health and safety of our staff, and we took all of those and we took those through to through the right process and we got cross-party approval, waited on the formal written threat assessment, done our risk assessment and got our staff back in. That was absolutely nothing to do and in complete parallel with the, the letter written to the Cabinet Office. And I, I, like, I know I've said this a few times, but I can't yeah, stress it enough. We, we, need, we need succinct answers, please, because we have more speakers and we've only got 10 minutes left, okay? 
Um, can, can I chair, if, if I can, and, and, I, and I wish to just shortly make the point, but could, yeah, could I maybe? Here, more speakers want to come in. I, I, I just want to suggest, though, is it is it possibly the case that the committee have been looking for a smoking gun with this letter? And the fact now that, that we have seen that it's not the smoking gun that the committee was looking for, in fact, it has, it has went through the, the, the council, that we're now delving into the net, you know, who, when was that said, what was the time, you know, who, who put it on the agenda? And, and you know, I, maybe, Chair, if I could ask you to maybe bring that back in, because, you know, I would, I would like to, to, to ask the members, what relevance has, has that got to, 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 to the, the three points on the... Uh, on, on the inquiry today, and you're quite right. I mean, we're now 12 minutes left, um, and as much as we would like to, to, to get in more, we, we, we have spent considerable time um, focusing on the letter, which, which unfortunately hasn't been this red herring that the, that the committee has, has hoped for. Okay, I'm going to move on around here. William? 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 Okay, can you hear me now? Yes. Yeah, thank okay. you, Chairman. Can I first of all thank the Mayor and Chief Executive for, for returning to provide uh, further clarity today? I want to say I feel extremely embarrassed uh, at you and brought back at a time when I'm sure you have met much more demands on the rules at the minute. Uh, I want to apologise for the way you've been personally treated throughout this entire witch hunt, witch hunt by some members of the committee. I, like many, have been absolutely appalled by the conduct of some of my colleagues who have been crying statements all left, right and centre and appear, appearing on radio programmes in relation to this issue. This has, meant, this has meant to be a fair platform to give evidence on the rationale of a decision to withdraw staff from the court. I don't know how this, can, this inquiry has one inch of credibility uh, when halfway through that, this inquiry there's calls for your head to roll uh, on, a, on an issue that I think is a side issue on a letter that had, uh, was irrelevant and looks irrelevant to the decision you've made. Of course, this, this was also followed up by uh, the appearance of political representatives from Nolan last week, which was nothing more than a washing session for half an hour and a shocking one sided, completely unjustified attack on your character. I am disgusted and want to tell you. You on the record, my thanks for the extraordinary work and leadership you've given. One question I just want to ask you, uh, given uh, I'm faced with the same circumstances, would you take the same course of action regarding the actions that you took? First of all, William, uh, thank you for for the apology and thank you for for the way you feel it. Uh, um, you know, as you know, I um, and I hope you know. Uh, I take my role as chief executive very seriously and I work very hard and always do the best I can for the people I serve. Um, you know, uh, in terms of, of how, I, how, how I operated and all the phone calls and the correspondence and all the information I passed to the PSNI, I'm bringing, bringing it through to the group party leaders and to the council meeting, I did the right thing. And it was the, after all, the elected members that made the decision. So, um, and I believe that um, given the same set of circumstances again, I certainly believe that our elected members uh, would make the same decision on the cross party basis. We have a, a chamber of very, very, uh, very level headed, skilled elected members who absolutely know, um, in my opinion, when, when things are, are real and when things need to be considered. I don't know if you wish to add to that. Yeah, and, and uh, just to reiterate from the, the chief there, um, William, really appreciate the, the comments and the uh, and the understanding of of uh, of what what we go through. And, and uh, maybe you know, maybe for for a committee, sometimes it, it can be routine um, for for, a query, for for these inquiries and for people to come forward. And, and it may I'm, I'm certainly not suggesting loses significance, but. For us, and, and certainly for the chief, this has been an extremely stressful process. It has been a process that has distracted uh, the chief executive from her current role, in which we, as, as Mid and East Antrim Council, need her in. We need her to be leading this council, leading the economic recovery of Mid and East Antrim, and leading the charge as we come out of this COVID um, pandemic. And let's not forget, we are still in 
a pandemic, we still have have, have lots to go, you know, and and really disappointingly, you know, on behalf of those businesses and on behalf of those constituents, we have now uh, lost that precious time um, of the chief executive at, at the helm. And sadly, you know, with regret, I have to say, um, and to, uh, I, I realise you, you had mentioned it as well, it, it has turned into a witch hunt. Um, and, I, you know, as mayor, it is my, my role. I, I want to protect, protect the chief executive and I have to refute, you know, any sort of... Um, anything like that we, we you know we, we we need a chief executive who is functioning is firing in all four cylinders and not distracted every time um a, a decision's made or a letter sent or i mean uh, on, on that basis we could be back in here every other week uh, you know, can, and, and can i can i just come in here i just want to re reiterate once again this is not a witch hunt we are concerned this here because if you are not implementing the tasks under the protocol and the international agreement, this will disrupt our east-west trade. And this is not a witch hunt. We, we are legitimately researching and investigating into this matter. So this is not a witch hunt. And the apology that the member made there was, was not on behalf of me or the committee. This We are literally doing our job. We have a statutory responsibility to do this here. Mr. Chairman, yes, I've been a member of this committee for 14 years. And in all that time, I have never seen politics been played like it. Like when you have members of this committee going on the radio and making accusations, we are, we are, we, are a sens we should be a sensible committee responding and asking sensible questions to the, 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 the chief executive. But whenever we get members of the committee going on radio and calling for a resignation, something that is totally outside the remit is ridiculous. And I think you'd accept that. Thank you. Thank you, William. We'll move around now to William or Philip. Sorry. <laughs> Thanks, uh, Chair. Thank you. Um, can I thank uh, the Mayor and the Chief Executive for coming along today? Uh, I want to thank the Mayor for his concern about the committee's workload uh, and, and his concern and his advice on how we should carry out his work. I mean, I, I want to assure the Mayor that, you know, as a statutory government committee and members of that statutory government committee, you know, we're well concerned or well aware of our own workload uh, and we will carry out our duties as and how we see fit uh, and the important issues that we see fit. We see this as an important issue. That's why we have instructed ourselves to carry out an inquiry into how this decision was made. And we will ask questions of whoever and uh, in the manner that we need to, to get to the bottom of this decision that was made. Uh, so uh, I also note the mayor in his lengthy preamble when he was concerned about the time talked about the quantity of evidence provided by Mid and East Antrim. And I can assure the Mayor, we are well aware of the quantity of evidence and pages uh, that we submitted to us on behalf of Mid and East Antrim. What we're concerned of as a committee is the quality of that evidence. And that's what this inquiry is about, is about dissecting quantity and trying to find quality of evidence. So Mayor, you, you, you said that the councillor's decision uh, on that night and on any given night is based on information provided to you by the chief executive. So, I mean, once again, I, I just want to put on record that since this decision was made and in terms of the evidence we have gathered both orally and written, you know, some of the information provided to us by your council and put to four councillors that night has been refuted. It has been refuted by trade unions, some of the evidence last week was refuted by the Chief Executive of Belfast City Council. It has been refuted by Solace, and it has been refuted by the PSNI. So our job is to go through all of that and listen carefully and dissect who's telling the truth and, and why decisions were made. So, I mean, today we have heard from yourselves and the PSNI. The PSNI indicated clearly Mid and East Antrim were confused about the nature of gold meetings compared to sectoral meetings. They were also uh, said that you were confused about risk assessments over threat assessments. We last week, between the last time you came here and today, you know, there you provided uh, incoherent and inconsistent evidence on who the letter was sent on behalf, what date the letter was sent uh, on, I mean, and, and, and evidence presented by the chief executive. She said clearly to me 
that the, the, the level chair, I, I'm not sorry, I'm not sure what the question is here, Chair. I'm, I'm trying to take notes, but the, it seems to be more like a, a statement than a question. The 4th of February, uh, when it wasn't, it was sent on the 30th of January, and she said it was stated that it was behalf of Solis. Solis have refuted that. She actually sent an email to the Dear a minister, where she said that the letter was written on behalf of Mid and East Antrim Council. So sitting here today, I'm still unclear as to who this letter was sent on behalf. I just want to ask a question, and given your concern for time, Mayor, I, I will ask this directly to the Chief Executive, and, and only really need the Chief Executive to answer. Uh, in relation to the letter wrote on the 30th of January, prior to the decision being made at Mid and East Antrim Council, uh, the Chief Executive says. Uh, in, ter in terms of her concerns, uh, because we've already dealt with the issue of the, the chief executive alluding to paramilitary activity and paramilitary groups that have been discredited by the PSNI, but she says, I have made the PSNI, PSNI aware of the ongoing issues, but I now feel compelled to take measures to protect the health, safety and well-being of my staff. So this was a number of days before uh, any discussion at council uh, and any uh, Councillor being made aware of this. So, can I ask the Chief Executive what did she mean by uh, taking measures to protect the safety and well being of the staff in that letter? Well, Philip, just firstly, I, I want to, to, to address you. You had mentioned uh, at the start there um, of your statement that all these different organisations and bodies have refuted this, and, and that's, not that's not correct, and I take exception to that. I'm happy to, to and, and for the benefit of doubt, when we when we uh, when we had our, our meeting uh, at the inquiry two weeks ago around the unions, yes, I was happy to clarify the separation of the unions and making the point of the number of plates. But to then say that that all of a sudden the unions are now refuting that we should have done that, and, 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 and you know that all of a sudden that all these bodies. I mean, we even had the PSNI on this morning, um, apologising and confirming that there was communication with uh, with Mid East Antrim throughout this, and I think that's commendable. Um, and you, you know, if I can, Philip, yes, I, I, I would like. Can I, cook, I mean, I, I don't need you to answer. With all due respect, Mayor, I don't need you to answer on behalf of the unions or the PSNI. We, we, we have gathered evidence from those groups. You know, I'd like the chief executive to ask the question, answer the question that I asked her. Yeah, but I think you know, Phil, I, and I hope you would you would agree. You mentioned the lengthy evidence, and you know, if I can, because I realise we're coming to the to the end, would you accept, in sight of all the evidence that you have been given? from today and from two weeks ago, would you accept that we as a council made the right decision on that day? The, the, I mean, the, this uh, committee will come to its conclusion in terms of the inquiry, and what we're well aware of is that the same evidence was provided to other councils who made different decisions. I, I, I'm, I, I'm, asking, I'm asking you personally, Philip, um, on this, to, you know, and, and I'm happy for you, for you to, because I think it's fair to do so, because you were, you were willing you know, to quite to, to come out quite personally on social media in the middle. So I think it would be a good opportunity now um, for you, if you wanted to put the record straight. Do you personally believe we took the right decision on the day based on the evidence that you had? What we're here to do is, I mean, I mean, you're not asking the questions with all due respect, uh, Mayor. Uh, I mean, this inquiry has got its terms of reference. I'm a member of this inquiry. You know, I'm asking the questions today. The, the inquiry will come up with its report, uh, and you will get good sight of that report as and when we do. I, I'd like to ask the Chief Executive the question, or get her to answer the question I asked in relation to her letter. So, and um, you mentioned there about the, 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 the chief executive of the other ports. I just want to clarify again, as I've already done, Philip, you know, law and ports are very different port. There's one way in and one way out, okay? The graffiti, the sinister graffiti that uh, threatened staff that said all border post staffs are targets was only in Lauren. It wasn't in Belfast. And the chief executive of Belfast confirmed at the DERA meeting that the graffiti in Belfast was in relation to part Okay, so I had, and um, these young staff had a drive past it. In addition to that, the, it changed over that weekend to multiple graffiti, multiple graffiti. So, you know, uh, the, the situation was, so there is a difference. The other difference in Lauren Port to Belfast Port and Warren Point is that in, in Belfast Port, the, their officers enjoy a compound where um, they are in a safe compound. 
The officers of Midney Centrum are not even within the boundaries of the Larnport compound. They're outside with one one security person on, and you know that is that. So that you can't measure, you can't compare apples and oranges, Philip. You know, and, and we have, but we have, and I ultimately have the responsibility for the health, safety, and well-being of the staff. It's a legal and a moral duty, and I I will never ever walk away from my legal and moral duty, Philip. Yes, to put it, to put it differently. With, with due respect, I mean, I, my question and, and my issue that I brought up wasn't about the differences between Larne and Belfast. I mean, mm -hmm. we, we have assessed all of this, and you know, there's nobody on this committee or outside of it that isn't concerned about councils or departments taking decisions on the basis of the safety of the staff. And, and the mayor was pushing me about what I would do or what I would do. What we're trying to get about is the information and the evidence that led to this decision. And when I raised the issue about the chief executive, it was in relation to the chief executive uh, questioning the veracity of stuff that Mid and East Antrim submitted on evidence. So, you know, we're not talking about the difference in ports. What we're trying to get to at the bottom of this is what evidence you used. Was it accurate? Was it where did it come from? Was it influenced by politics? All of these things. And I mean, you, you have wrote a letter to uh, the British Cabinet Office. Uh, and, you know, I mean, the, you, there's a lot of talk about uh, confidential. I mean, I, I would be shocked that an uh, official would write that letter and think it should be kept confidential. I, I, you know, personally speaking, I'm shocked. I mean, I, I've been about politics for a long time. I've never seen an official write such a highly political letter. I mean, a letter that, for example, could have been taken straight from the pages of a DUP manifesto or, or press release. So I'm shocked about the content of the letter uh, in terms of a, a, a council officer given. Sorry, no, no, no Chair, I'm going to have, I, I have to interject there, Chair. I take complete the, exception to that one. That's a big accusation well, 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 to well, say well, that well, a letter well, from a civil well, servant well, would, would appear on a DUP manifesto. I, I have to take exception to that. That's that is, um, and, and, and I, would, I would ask the member to, to withdraw that remark.